Throughout the 1980s, women, many of them very young women, kept turning up dead along some of the same interstates around the southeastern United States. Soon, some similarities in the murders emerged. Besides most of the women being young, many of them had red or reddish hair, and in a lot of cases, they had been strangled in addition to being sexually assaulted. Also, most of the victims were Jane Doe's, women whom, it seemed, no one had reported missing. And at the time, it appeared that no one was looking for them, or at least no one locally was looking for them. It was likely they had ended up far from home. As more and more of these victims were found, investigators started to wonder if the murders were the work of a serial killer. Various law enforcement agencies from numerous states met up to compare notes and discuss possible suspects. And soon the series of killings was called the Redhead Murders by the Press. The possibility of a serial killer on the loose, of course, struck fear into the hearts of many. Who was cruising along these highways, looking for victims, brutally murdering redheaded young women, dumping their bodies by the roadside, and driving back out of the area? The more that investigators compared notes, the more they began to think that the evidence of one serial killer just didn't add up. It was now speculated that multiple killers were likely involved, possibly multiple serial killers. And that is still the speculation. Investigators still can't even say today with complete certainty how many victims there are, which cases are related, or even the identity of several of the victims. Making things harder, all the known suspects are now dead. In this week's episode, I'll provide the important known details of the redhead murders, the challenges investigators have faced over the years in solving these crimes, how some of the killings came to be attributed to the Bible Belt Strangler, and how a dedicated group of Tennessee students in recent years breathed new life into the investigation of who killed these women and who were these women. Time for another true crime, ongoing mystery. It's only going to get harder and harder to get away with murder thanks to continual forensic investigation tech advances. Is my dad behind some or all of these murders? Edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins. Suck nasty. Rambo fan. Know that it's over. You just don't turn it off. Brick bad aficionado. And you are listening to Time Suck. Uh, quick thanks to Cody Garrett, the donut operator for the t-shirts. Uh, he was wearing one of mine on a, on a recent YouTube video. Really, really cool. Really cool guy. Uh, come see me in Phoenix this weekend. Help me figure out what new ideas I have or good for stand up. Here's some old bits. Have some fun. I'll be at Stand Up Live April 21st and 22nd. Then I'll be in Bloomington, Indiana, May 4th, 5th, and 6th at the Comedy Attic. Then Madison, Comedy on State, May 11th, 12th, and 13th. Then nowhere. Well, I'll be, I'll be uh, hopefully I'll be somewhere. I'll be, I'll be living and doing things that are not related to stand-up shows uh, for quite a while. Other than the little comedy open mics around here where I will uh, hopefully sneak in and out unnoticed. Recording a, a bit in advance. Still don't have the donation amount, but I know that we are donating in April to BigTable.com. It's actually big-table.com. Uh, one in six restaurant workers are below the official poverty line. Double any other working population. 43% make less than economists say is needed just to make ends meet. Every one of the 10 lowest paid jobs in the country is in the restaurant and hospitality industry based on 2020 statistics. And people working in this industry is who this charity serves. They provide crisis care to workers in the restaurant and hospitality industry. Kids get sick. You have to stay home, be with them, and now you don't have uh, money to pay rent. Well, this organization is one of the ones that will step up and help you pay that rent, amongst many other things. They, they do a lot. They're very multifaceted. To learn more about them, please visit big-table.com. And then uh, for merch this week... Available now at the Bad Magic Merch Store. Fucking Quipple! Irish Mob Edition Merchandise. Featuring my good friend John, Old Smoke Morrissey, and some other dirtbag he's about to beat to death. Whipple, Irish Mob Edition merch, suddenly features some of the official five points weaponry, including spike clubs, knives, fists, a three-leaf clover. Yeah, a clover's a weapon when you've had enough fuck Whipple strong enough to kill Liam Neeson. Choose from a basic tee, premium tee, and a wall flag to display your Whipple pride. The flag also doubles nicely as a means to roll up a body and hide it. You didn't hear that from me. Bite off some noses, brick back some faces, fuck you, fuck your family, and get Whipple! Irish Mob Edition merchandise now, available at badmagicmerch.com. That was a high-octane fucking merch pitch there. Uh, and that's it for announcements. So let's fucking go. Let's get into this uh, story time. Today, we're going to walk through a timeline of all the redhead murders slash Bible Belt Strangler victims. We'll go over known details of some of the lives of the known victims and the investigations into their deaths. 
You get to know a few of the main suspects in some of the murders. Talk about how important it still is to solve these cases, to give closure to the families and friends of the victims, even if the killers are certainly dead, and look into some of the cool new science now being used to solve murder cases. It just keeps advancing. A lot of cool fucking meat sacks pushing things forward. Uh, here's how I'll break down this information today. I'm going to start with an overview of the redhead murders, followed by how a belief in an uncaught serial killer known as the Bible Belt Strangler came into existence, followed by a brief discussion on why these cases are so difficult to solve. And then we'll get into the timeline, look at all the suspected redhead murder victims one by one, as well as potential suspects while learning about the new investigative techniques along the way. And I'll share some important details about my dad from time to time, shedding some insight into how he may very well be connected to all of this. Let us begin. Uh, Initially, all the victims I'm covering today were linked, uh, albeit loosely in several cases, to the redhead murders. A series, again, of unsolved murders of mostly redheaded women in the U.S. Not the best name, actually, for these murders because uh, a lot of the victims don't have red hair. Uh, Sometimes other details, such as where the bodies were found, when the victims died, how the victims were killed, is what linked them to the redhead murders. Occasionally, the name the press or law enforcement assigns to a group of murders believed to be connected in some way uh, does not actually end up being the best fitting name. In this case, the press noticed that several victims had red hair. That name was tossed out, printed, it stuck, even when uh, several other victims did not have red hair. Now here we are. Uh, it is generally accepted that these murders took place between 1981 and 1990, but sources do differ on these dates since there are several examples of maybe this murder is connected to the other victims. Interestingly, my dad was between the age of 27 and 36 during this stretch. He was in great shape during those years. I have the pictures to prove it. Very strong. Uh, There are huge gaps in time where no one can uh, conclusively account for his whereabouts. He did have a temper when he was younger, and he loved the ladies, especially redheads. My first stepmom was a redhead. Talked a lot about how redheads really did it for him. Right? He met her in 1988 or 1989, I believe, kind of in the the thick of this. So, you know, mm, adds up. And he's a charming dude, and he's not super stable. Makes one wonder. Anyway, these murders took place in southern states such as Arkansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, West Virginia, Georgia, and North Carolina. My dad said he wasn't in those states during those years, but would he admit that? (laughs) If he's connected to all this? I don't think so. The majority of these murders are currently believed to be the work of one or more unidentified male serial killers. Uh, The victim count ranges from 6 to 14. Only some of the redhead murder victims have been identified. We'll cover all 14 maybe possibly connected murders or murders at least thought to be connected at one time today in the timeline. Back in 1985, law enforcement agencies from multiple states first joined together to discuss the so-called redhead murders. Jefferson County, Tennessee Sheriff David Davenport told the producers of the A&E series True Crime that at that time, they were focusing on nine to 10 murders of unidentified women who mostly did have red hair, excluding one brunette, you know, maybe a strawberry blonde. Uh, They were all found along different interstates. Davenport said that about the potential suspect, It was always thought at the time that it was a long-distance truck driver. Hmm. My dad's a good mechanic. He's taken apart cars, put them back together, started doing that right around 1981. Never been a long-distance truck driver to my knowledge, but again, there's so much I don't know about him. And if you're new to Time Suck, by the way, don't get too confused about my dad comments. You can ignore ignore him. Maybe at your own peril, but you can't ignore him. Maybe just an old gag here. (laughs) Or a real concern about a lot of crimes, especially unsolved crimes that I've had for quite some time. Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Special Agent Brandon Elkins also spoke with A&E True Crime and said police did all they could do then, but the top-notch technology basically was blood typing, which only provides a circumstantial pattern at best. We were able to resubmit evidence using techniques we currently use, and we were able to obtain DNA evidence that ultimately ultimately led to solving the case. Now, his use of the word solving here does not mean that all of these murders have been solved because that's not even close to the case. Uh, Later forensic techniques have pretty conclusively solved mm, two of the murders. A third looks pretty damn guilty. This third suspect and another one. None of them ever ever stood trial though for their murders. They were were already dead, as I mentioned. Recently, the unknown killer linked to some of these murders has been given a new name, the title of the Bible Belt Strangler. And let me explain the connection between the so-called redhead murders and the so-called Bible Belt Strangler since I was confused myself. Looking into this topic that the Space Lizard Patreon supporters of this show voted for me to explore, 
On May 15th, 2018, a small group uh, of Elizabethan, Elizabethan Tennessee high school students presented their research on the redhead murders. They studied the victims. The prof- they profiled the suspected killer and came up with the moniker Bible Belt Strangler. Student Kayla Vandeventer told Knoxville local uh, NBC affiliate WBIR that they chose the name Bible Belt Strangler for the six victims they focused on, quote, because Nashville is the buckle of the Bible Belt and these surround Nashville and we think Knoxville or Nashville is where the killer lived. Uh, the students have been working on the research for months. They've been led by their sociology teacher, Alex Campbell, who'd been fascinated with some of the unsolved redhead murders in and around Tennessee for years. And he wanted his students to not only learn something useful in his class, but to do something useful as well. In this case, he wanted them to learn what life is like for their fellow citizens who are living along the very bottom rungs of the, of the socioeconomic ladder in America. Excuse me. And also, he wanted these students to simultaneously do something to help these fellow citizens. Campbell told WBIR, there's a whole other side of life we don't think about much. And sometimes those people aren't represented and we wanted to do something to help them. His students believe that the suspect was slash is in the trucking industry and as referenced by the name that his preferred modus operandi operandi, come on, uh, was strangulation. That word actually, uh, I pause on it because modus operandi, modus operandi, both, uh, both play. Five out of six cases they primarily focused on were Jane Doe's at the time. Their efforts led to several being identified thanks to renewed interest in the case and advances in forensic investigation techniques. And these six victims will cover all these women in the timeline. There'll be six of the first nine victims I'll mention. And they were found in Wetzel County, West Virginia, February 1983, Crittenden County, Arkansas, September 1984, Campbell County, Tennessee, January of 1985, uh, Cheatham County, Tennessee, March 1985, Knox County, Kentucky, April 1985, and Greene County, Tennessee, also April 1985. Alex Campbell had the students analyze 11 unsolved murders in total in Tennessee and other states. Uh, We'll actually go over all 11 in the timeline and a few extra murders that uh, have been lumped in together with all this. And he and his students found similarities among the six I just listed. All these victims were thin white women with red hair killed between 1983 and 1985. They were suffocated or strangled and found close to major roadways. And the police believe that all of them were hitchhikers or sex workers or both. These six victims did not show evidence of sexual assault. So they theorized that the killer murdered them because he thought they were, quote, harmful to society. Student created an eight page profile of the killer in May of 2018. You can find it in its entirety online. Just link from this episode's notes if you'd like to. But I will share most of it here right now. It's fucking excellent. Very impressed. Again, this is this is high school students putting this together. Here's the profile. Sex, male. Rationale. The killer only preys on females and serial killers almost always target the opposite sex or those they feel sexual attraction to unless it is a comfort killer. The killer was able to overpower the victims, attacking up close with bare hands. Along with this, the distance between the roads and location of the discovered bodies is significant. Dozens of yards away and up-down gradients to the dump sites without drag marks or use of any mechanical advantage which shows the killer had to have enough strength to carry the bodies over broken ground, indicating a larger and stronger male's ability to overpower a smaller and weaker female. There has been no recorded instance of a female serial killer who used physical strength or up-close methods of killing. Females are almost always comfort killers that use poison, rarely using weapons, guns, knives, axes, etc., which give a female power over a male to kill. Females almost always kill people they know, In this situation, the suspect is killing unknown people. Also assuming the killer is a commercial truck driver, nearly all in this time period were male. Age. Date of birth no later than 1962, but no earlier than 1936. Rationale. I love how they broke this down. Nearly all serial killers began their murders in their late teens or early to mid-20s, the age in which most mental disorders often manifest themselves and are diagnosable. The killer would need to be relatively full-grown in order to accomplish the killings, since they were committed with bare hands. The killer must also be of uh, be of or above the legal age required to possess a commercial driver's license in order to carry out the killings at such a long distance. The upper end of the age range would be 48 at the time of the last known victim. There comes a time when age slash health slash strength will become a limiting factor in killing with your bare hands and moving adult bodies over a distance. We feel that around 50 would be the time period this would begin to limit his physical ability to no longer conduct the crimes in the same way. Height, 5'9 to 6'2. Rationale, 
The killer must be average height or taller in order to overpower the victims efficiently. I guess these kids haven't seen a lot of uh, short, strong guys. Uh, but they continue, it would be not, it would not be practical for the killer to attack someone bigger and taller due to the fact that bare hands were used to kill. Okay, makes sense. If the killer had to carry victims to the dump site, the suspect would need to be able to hoist them and carry them without leaving evidence of the body's movement. A limit on height slash size is necessary. Because if a trucker was inordinately large, the suspect may frighten a potential victim or draw unwanted attention at the truck stops, restaurants, and rest areas that truckers frequent. Put a lot of thought into all this. Uh, Weight, 180 to 270 pounds. Rationale, the killer must be average to above average weight in order to have the confidence that needed to overpower, they needed to overpower the victims and move the bodies with only brute strength. It is likely the killer has a muscular build because of the method of killing and disposing of the bodies. Since the suspect is considered to be a truck driver, which is often sedentary, extra weight, especially in an older suspect, would be suspected. Weight also factors into the successful methods of killing, strangulation, suffocation, and blunt force trauma. We can also conclude that since the suspect is most likely from or living in the South for a long period of time, and the South is consistently rated as the most overweight section of the contiguous U.S., that there is a higher chance that extra body weight is carried. Just fucking cold logic. Love it. Where does he live slash work? On or around Interstate 40 slash Knoxville, Tennessee region. Rationale. A job as a truck driver most assured uh, assuredly requires the suspect to frequently travel Interstate 40. All of the murders trend along the I-40 corridor or along roads that branch off from the interstate, such as I-75 and I-81. We feel that many of the possible Jane Doe's outside of the main six are from areas that do not fit this pattern and can thus be excluded. The only victim that is not found along an interstate is the Wetzel County, West Virginia victim who was only found along a state highway. We do recognize the difference in this one, uh, this one part of the MO, but also feel that this was most likely the first known victim by looking at police data from the crime and estimations of time of death. It would not be that unusual to find a small change in MO after the first victim, which does not indicate a change in signature. That road still connects to uh, major cities in West Virginia, and the victim was seen possibly hitchhiking from one of those. Knoxville appears to be at the geographical center of the murders and also has I-40 going through it as well. We feel that anywhere along the I-40 corridor running from Knoxville to Nashville is a possibility there are more bodies found along interstates that connect through Knoxville slash Campbell, uh, Knox, and Greene County victims. We feel that the killer either lives in a close proximity to Knoxville or works out of there as a part of a job. Nashville is another possibility. However, unless there are unknown victims that would shift the ge- ge- bleh, geographical center of the killings, we feel that Nashville only appears to be a possibility because of its proximity to I-40 in size. Motive to kill. Mission. But cannot rule out a lust sexual component. Rationale. There is evidence that the killer could be motivated by a mission, thrill, or power slash control. We feel that a mission-oriented motive is the most likely motive. We have excluded lust as a singular motive, since murders of this motivation usually involve overkill and a sexual nature to the crime, including rape, object penetration, and necrophilia. We cannot totally exclude lust as a possible motive as the victims were found nude or partially clothed, and most of the victims, who all have similar physical features, were most likely in the sex industry of prostitution. We also do feel, or do not feel, that it is a thrill killer because they often perform aberrant sexual actions upon the victim, use a weapon to torture the victim, rape the victim, and usually perform object penetration. We also do not feel that it is a power-slash-control killer because there is almost always evidence of victim torture before death, binding of the victim including ligatures, aberrant sexual activity, rape, object penetration, and necrophilia. We feel that this killer is most likely a mission-oriented unknown subject due to the fact that the killer's motive matches best with the characteristics of a mission killer. After using a table produced by law enforcement to narrow the motives of serial killers by using characteristics of their crimes, mission-oriented scored a 13 out of a possible 15, while thrill scored 11 and power slash control scored 10. There were no signs of rape, necrophilia, torture, binding of hands, feet, torture weapons, ruling out almost all other categories besides mission. Mission Mission-oriented killers often see their victims as a means to accomplish an end. Most of the time, these killers attack elements of society that they see as undesirable or harmful to society, thus convincing themselves they are, quote, helping save society by cleansing it of its undesirables. This often leads them to killing prostitutes, homosexuals, homeless, etc. The victims in this case were most likely prostitutes and the suspect may feel a duty to, quote, clean the world of trash. There are only three areas 
that the mission hypothesis does not totally correlate with the expected results. Movement of body after death, strangling as a cause of death, and rape of the victim. We feel the body movement can be explained by several factors. First, many mission-oriented killers are often mentally troubled, suffering from schizophrenia or paranoid schizophrenia. Because of this, they do not move bodies as they actually believe they are doing good instead of breaking a law. Obviously, our killer knows laws are being broken, taking extensive precautions to cover any trace of identity. The suspect appears to not only be mentally sane, but also at least average to above average in intelligence. Oftentimes, mission killers do not use strangulation as the cause of death. Our killer used strangulation on some victims, but also used suffocation and blunt force trauma to the head as causes of death. We feel that this is not a serious problem with our killer. With many mission killers, there is often sexual assault or rape of the victim. This is not present in our killer, but the suspect does leave victims nude or partially clothed. We feel that this mindset of seeing the prostitutes as dirty and evil may prevent sexual contact with his victims, although some pleasure is extracted from undressing the bodies and leaving them exposed. Occupation, truck driver. Rationale, the killer must travel frequently, as all of the bodies except one were found next to the interstate, with one being beside a major highway between moderately large cities within a state. Commercial truck drivers have a larger radius for travel than most other jobs. The commercial freight liner would provide more concealment and space to hide slash transport bodies over multiple days, as evidence suggests a couple of the bodies were not dumped until several days after their death, giving the suspect frequent access and opportunity. That's a really smart note. A uh, truck stop beside the interstate is totally normal and would not call as much attention as a car stop beside the interstate would. The Motor Carrier Regulatory Reform and Modernization Act, more commonly known as the Motor Carrier Act of 1980, was a law that deregulated the trucking industry. Since the law was passed, the number of new firms increased dramatically. By 1990, the number of licensed carriers exceeded 40,000, more than twice that of 1980. Combined with the Staggers Act of 1980, intermodal freight transport surged expanding 70% between 1981 and 1986. This caused tens of thousands of more jobs to open up in the trucking industry, which possibly could have caused the unknown subject to be employed in one of those new jobs, thus providing the opportunity to kill as never experienced before. Possibly this new exposure to the prostitution trade as a truck driver could have been the trigger that fueled the mission-oriented motive for killing. We feel the truck driver hypothesis is more likely than others who travel for their jobs like salesmen, nurses, etc., the reason is that suspects kill and dump where they feel comfortable. Salesmen may travel the interstates, but most of their interaction with people is away from the interstates, in town and business areas. If they desire to kill prostitutes, they would acquire them in the cities. If the killer were traveling, uh, a traveling member of the healthcare community, he, she would most likely acquire victims in and around healthcare facilities. Many serial killers have killed patients and those in the facilities for the age, uh, aged and if this killer were a member of the healthcare community, he, she would most likely follow that pattern. Race, white. Rationale. Only Caucasians are sufficiently evil enough to commit acts like these. Our teachers made it clear to us that white men are the bane of human existence. And if there were any true justice, all white men would be put to death immediately. Think about it. Hitler, Stalin, Ted Bundy, Jim Jones, Ed Kemper, Dan's dad. All white men, all evil killers. Uh, JK, no, they didn't provide that rationale. Uh, here's what they provided. Rationale, all the victims are Caucasian. It is most common for serial killers to kill victims of the same race. Over 90% do. Most killers are comfortable killing victims of the same race as they often are found in areas that are racially homogenous to themselves and do not stand out when acquiring victims. The percentage of African-American truck drivers in the 1980s was presumably lower than the average percentage for African-Americans in other jobs as trucking did require some form of certification to qualify for the job. It would be also much less suspicious in the South which still experienced overt racism for a white to acquire white victims. It would therefore be much less suspicious if the perpetrator were white and the same race as his victim. Personal relationships. Yes. Possible long-term relationships. Rationale. The killer shows all the signs of being an organized killer by acquiring, killing, and dumping bodies in separate states. He also lures victims instead of just killing them where they are found. Therefore, it is most likely that the suspect is at least average to slightly above average in his intelligence and understands basic police techniques, which has aided his ability to remain undetected. His above-average IQ helps to understand that these desires are not normal and must be hidden using what Harvey Cleckley referred to as the mask of sanity. He makes those around him feel that he is normal and makes others feel at ease in his presence, even though underneath he has a brutal desire to kill. He gets prostitutes and hitchhikers to go with him, although they are more willing to do so. Even members of those communities will not go with a person that appears violent, 
strange, or just off. This ability will likely lead to heightened communication skills, which may lead him to being perceived as having an awkward sense of innocence, but an approachable demeanor. Organized killers are often capable of serious or long-term relationships. Ted Bundy was engaged. Dennis Rader was married, etc. This killer will most likely have been involved with serious relationships, including girlfriends, even long-term, and possibly even a wife. He will also probably have close friends that, after being told, may have seen some warning signs, like sudden rage or rants against his victim type, but will most likely be surprised that he was responsible for so many violent and brutal acts. Relative location of residence around Knoxville or Nashville. Rationale, Knoxville may be considered the center of the crimes if the Wetzel County victim is included. If Wetzel County is not included, Nashville is a geographic center. It is likely the suspect resides in one of these cities for access to the multiple dumping sites and access to interstates and roads. We do feel that the Wetzel County, West Virginia victim may be exhibiting unusual signs as it was most likely the first victim. Religion slash religious motivation slash affiliation, possibly Christian. Rationale, the killer is likely to live in and around the Bible Belt in which the percentage of evangelical Christian adults is over 50% in most parts. Those numbers of practicing evangelicals were also higher in the 1980s than present. Nashville is also known as the buckle of the Bible Belt. If the killer resides in this state, he is likely exposed to large amounts of Christianity from his family and society, even if he or his family is not devout. Medical history slash slash, uh, physical wounds, defensive wounds from victims. Rationale, the killer may have possible scars or marks on his body from the victims trying to defend themselves. Since the suspect kills victims with bare hands and close contact, it would likely uh, it would be likely they scratched, clawed, slapped, and bit in an attempt to save their lives. This would not require medical attention and is often easily explained away as side effects of the job as a trucker loading and securing cargo. Family history, unstable home, absent father, domineering mother. Rationale, it is likely that the killer grew up in an unstable home. The family members may have abused drugs or alcohol, which led to an increasingly unstable home, which included fights between adults, angry outbursts, etc., There could also be a heightened chance that the suspect grew up with a mother of undesirable characteristics as females are targeted. Having a frequently absent or not intimately involved father also most likely contributed to the suspect's attacks. Right or left-handed, right-handed. Rationale, well, the majority of people in the U.S. are right-handed. IQ, 100 plus. Rationale, the killer is organized and nearly all organized killers have historically had had IQs in the average to slightly above average range. It is suspected that the crimes were committed in a different place than the bodies were dumped. When bodies are taken from the original crime scene and disposed of in other places, this almost always indicates an organized killer. Considering that none of the original crime scenes, including a place of abduction or death, are known, it is almost assuredly an organized offender, giving credence to the rationale of an average to above average IQ. Sexuality is heterosexual. Rationale, serial killers tend to target the gender they're attracted to, and and this suspect only targets females. Also, over 98% of the population surveyed in the 80s was listed as heterosexual. It is true that we feel that the perpetrator seems to be mission-oriented due to the fact he, she is killing possible prostitutes because they are often deemed dirty or undesirable. This may not assure that he is heterosexual by himself, but he at least feels comfortable in the situation hiring a female for sexual activity, which we feel almost assuredly makes the suspect heterosexual. Criminal history, possible solicitation. Rationale, victims are suspected sex workers, transients, and estranged from their families. Due to the fact victims go unreported for very long periods of time and were picked up on the side of the road, it can be inferred that the victims are estranged from their families. Prostitutes are also very popular with truck drivers, so the killer may have been cited before for similar occurrences. He made sure to pick victims that probably would not have been missed. There also may be some history of various common variety criminal activities, such as public intoxication, angry outbursts, etc., Considering the suspect is a truck driver, it would not be unlikely the traffic citations associated with his job were acquired. Almost done here, but build thick, stocky. Rationale, the perpetrator is able to strangle, suffocate, and bludgeon victims with physical superiority. There is no evidence of any physical weapons, meaning the killer is confident enough to attack the victim without a weapon. He is also physically able to carry bodies to the side of the interstate, along with the fact the assumed, uh, along with the fact the assumed lends itself to short period of physically demanding labor, all of these characteristics combined to give an average to above average, athletic, stocky, slightly overweight build. Mental health, no history. Rationale, similar to the majority of organized serial killers, the perpetrator operates in a manner that does not draw suspicion. The killer is able to keep the mask of sanity despite being mentally disturbed, so there is most likely no reported history of mental health issues with the killer. However, 
uh, you know, there may, they may actually be mentally ill. So anyway, uh, what a profile. Hail Alex Campbell and his students. Uh, interestingly, my dad is heterosexual. Born between 1936 and 1962, right? Born in 1954. Weighed between 180, 270 pounds. Right around 185 during the killings. Stands about 5'11", barely six foot. Perfectly between 5'9 and 6'2". He was raised Christian by a Pentecostal pastor. Definitely identified as Christian back then. Had problems with his mom. Mom was very domineering, right? Dad was a little emotionally distant. Very strong hands from years of construction work. He'd beaten people up for sure around the time. Kicked ass at arm wrestling. Kind of makes me think he would have been pretty good at strangling. And look, I'm not saying that my dad is the Bible Belt Strangler. To be clear, he probably didn't even live in Knoxville or Nashville. Might not have been a truck driver, but who knows? I just don't know where the fuck he was most of the time back then. Uh, These same students theorized that the killer stopped killing or at least moved on to killing victims somewhere else when he quit working as a truck driver. During their press conference, one student read a letter from a 34-year-old woman named Elizabeth Pilgrim who believed she might be the daughter of the Kentucky victim. Pilgrim was quoted by the Times Tribune as saying, hopefully this team can find the person that committed these awful crimes. These women were somebody to someone and each and every one deserves for their story to be known and justice to be served. The hope of one day finding what happened to her has never left my thoughts. I feel like what I've been waiting for all these years is unfolding before me. Uh, Elizabeth was right about her mom. I will share more details in the timeline. Uh, law enforcement in various counties attended the presentation, hoped that the publicity would lead to some new tips. The class following the presentation worked with law enforcement to learn about profiling and case details. Also worked with Indiana investigative journalist and podcaster Shane Waters, who hosts the podcast Out of the Shadows. Uh, not sure if that's currently active, but at least it was. Uh, Waters traveled thousands of miles to the crime scenes the students uh, focused on. The victims believed to be the Bible Belt Strangler victims. And they put up six crosses to represent the six victims. Alex Campbell closed the press conference by stating, Bible Belt Strangler, we know you're out there. We know someone saw something. And after today, everyone knows we are looking for you. We are our sister's keepers. We are their family. Okay, so why had Elizabeth been waiting so long to find out about her mom? Why have these murders been so difficult to solve? Jeff Summers wrote about the difficulties in the Redhead Murders case in a 2022 grunge article titled, Why the Redhead Murders Remain Unsolved. Uh, In most cases, the victims were not very close with their families at the times of their disappearances. Some of them were likely homeless and may have done sex work, making them members, as we've been reminded over and over in our true crime episodes here, of an extremely vulnerable population. The police described the women as lost in society, according to Knoxville News. Also, Summers uh, wrote, uh, um, excuse me. Yes. Okay. Jeff Summers. Yeah. Making sure I say the right thing. Also, Jeff Summers wrote, uh, that doesn't mean that individual officers didn't care or do their best to investigate the crimes, but the low social status of the victims combined with the lack of grieving family members pushing for updates and media coverage to elevate the cases in the public eye resulted in a lack of urgency. You know, sad reality of life. The squeaky wheel does tend to get the grease and no one was squeaking or most of these women were concerned. And I wish I could have thought of a better analogy there, by the way. The squeaky wheel gets the grease phrase is an apt reference for this comparison, but no one was squeaking is just not a cool uh, thing to say. Doesn't doesn't sound cool. Uh, Another reason these murders went unsolved was the lack of the same forensic tools we have now. DNA analysis was a brand new investigative tool not employed by all law enforcement agencies when the redhead murders occurred and it was not used when the bodies were first found. However, as the years have passed, DNA from these victims has been uploaded to national databases and in several cases has led to the identification of the victims, as you will soon find out. Yet another reason these murders uh, were not solved back in the 80s was jurisdictional, 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 extra syllables there, uh, confusion. Too many cooks in the kitchen, to quote another old saying, and no one was cooking in these women's kitchens. That phrase doesn't work at all. When you, uh, when you try and change it that way. Uh, but there were too many cooks. At least seven law enforcement agencies were working on the different cases. And that led to confusion about the actual number of victims. Uh, a, there was a lack of everyone having the same evidence, etc. cetera. Uh, super fucking dark and sad additional reason these murders were never solved is that these kind of murders uh, were, probably still are, super common. The LA Times reported back in the 80s that the FBI believed there may have been more than 750 U.S. highway murder victims across the U.S., Right, and the FBI had a list of 450 potential suspects in those murders. FBI also believed that many of the killers were likely truck drivers. So sadly, these murders were just a few of many, many unsolved murders involving women dumped along the side of the road, likely killed by truck drivers around this time. 
And further complicating all of this is that the victims were far from home. The victims who have been identified were not residents of those areas where they were found. That made it so much harder to identify the victims and thus figure out who they'd been seen with, right? Uh, you know, to, so they could zero in on a suspect, which would have been a lot easier if the victims were local. Finally, with these murders, there was the advantage of picking up victims and later dumping their bodies along the side of so many remote stretches of America's freeways and highways, right? Which, which at night, there's, there's likely not going to be any witnesses. And this is why we, we have, uh, you know, covered so many serial killers who have done this. The three freeway killers come to mind first, Patrick Trashbag Killer Carney or Kearney, William Bonin and his death van and Randy the scorecard killer Kraft. The Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 led to the construction of the U.S.'s national system of interstates and defense highways, over 42,000 miles of new uh, asphalt across the nation. And all these new roads made the transportation we now rely on for the quick movement of goods possible. And it has helped our, our lives uh, tremendously, improved them greatly. But there's also been a dark side to this development. Ginger Strand wrote in her book, Killer on the Road, Violence in the American Interstate. Before the concrete was dry on the new roads, however, a specter began haunting them. The highway killer. Some of these criminals were imagined, but many were real. Highway violence followed hard on the heels of interstate construction. The nation's murder rate shot up in the 60s and 70s. America became more violent and more mobile at the same time. Yeah, highways can be very useful tools for killers. Uh, very dangerous places for victims. For killers, they provide easy escape routes. Vulnerable hitchhikers can be picked up by anyone driving on these uh, highways. And victims can be dumped, you know, in so, so many places outside of towns and heavily wooded areas just off the side of the road. All that makes me think about the highway I grew up along. Uh, for most of my childhood, I lived within about 100 yards uh, of Highway 95 that connects northern and southern Idaho. And long stretches of this highway, like uh, most of the 45-mile stretch north of where I grew up, are so remote, so dark at night. Uh, so dark that Lindsay does not like to drive this highway at night. It creeps her out. The road follows the main fork of the Salmon River most of the time as it cuts through a very narrow little canyon fenced in by steep mountain ridges on each side. That means you get a lot less of the sky than you would uh, uh, you know, on a prairie. So there's going to be less light, less stars, you know, uh, less likely the moon's going to illuminate anything. And there's uh, no street lights at all for long stretches. Very, very few homes, so no lights there. No witnesses. Also, thanks to big bends in the road, right, which fall in the river, uh, you can see any and all approaching cars coming from like a mile or more away in many places. So you generally have like in these places, 60 or more seconds to hide whatever shady shit you're doing, like dumping a body. And there's a whole bunch of these little campgrounds right next to the road, but also down below the road and next to the river. And often they're hidden behind some pine trees or sometimes they're up above the road, you know, tucked behind a little bank of dirt where the highway's cutting through some mountains. Basically, in addition to the remoteness, there are just so fucking many places to quickly hide where as long as you kill your engine, turn off all your lights, no one passing by is going to know you're there. Also, very little law enforcement pro patrolling this area. People cruising by when they are cruising by, uh, you know, do uh, so at 65 miles per hour plus, generally don't have their windows down. So even if someone were screaming from one of these campgrounds, who would hear them? No one lives near many of these little campgrounds. And in the winter, most of the time, no one's camping there. Also in the winter at night, zero boat traffic on the river. And yet I've seen lone hitchhikers in this area over the years. I've seen young women out by themselves on the side of this highway with their thumbs out. I'm sure my dad has, you know, he lived around this area for a long time, but it's terrifying. And even if you're not hitchhiking in this area, if you're picked up by someone somewhere else and now they're driving you through this area, they could so easily hide your remains, dump you in the river, etc. So if you're ever thinking about getting into a stranger's vehicle for any reason, going for a ride, think about shit like I just went over. And maybe don't get into their vehicle. Maybe go to the, you know, YWCA. We have a place called Safe Passage here in Coeur d'Alene. Go to a place that, that help people in, uh, in need if, you're, if you don't have the money and you need to get away to escape some violence, you know, lover or whatever. Just take a breath, take a beat, hide in, in a place where you can gather a little bit of funds to get a bus ticket or something as opposed to risking your life hitchhiking. Yeah, there's just places all over the U.S. where you can so easily disappear. Forensic advancements, uh, they don't matter if no one can find your remains. Okay, now that I've just gone over how difficult it was to solve these murders, and hopefully not given any killers uh, any good ideas on where they should hide their next bodies in Idaho County, let's examine the murders themselves. Learn a bit about the victims when we can. Also learn a bit about who likely killed some of these women when we can. And find out who some of these Jane Does actually were thanks to advances in forensic investigative technology 
and renewed interest in these murders, partially due to those Elizabethton, Tennessee high school students led by their sociology teacher, Alex Campbell, hasn't heard either. It is timeline time. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. May 25th, 1981, a Jane Doe's dead body is found in a low water crossing on Highway MM near Dixon, Pulaski County, Missouri. She had been living just five, four, or four to five hours earlier. She was beaten and strangled and left in the shallow water, a pair of pantyhose wrapped around her neck. The woman was wearing, quote, stylish clothing, had expensive dental work, and seemed to be in good health. Believed to be a- aged anywhere from 25 to 40. The victim had black hair but has been linked by some to the redhead murders based on a similar MO. Not thought to be one of the Bible Belt Strangler victims. She was named the Pulaski County Jane Doe. Isotope testing showed that she hadn't lived in Missouri for more than a few years, and she probably spent most of her life in the southeastern U.S. And I don't remember hearing about isotope testing when it comes to determining determining where a victim lived before. So let's talk about this for a moment. Uh, Pretty fascinating technological advancement, I think, when it comes to helping solve cold cases. And also helping a little, at least, uh, to find their killer. It seems, from what I can determine, that isotope testing was first used a little over 20 years ago by law enforcement. Per 2019 information, it is estimated that 4,400 unidentified bodies are recovered just in the U.S. each year, with 1,000 of them remaining unidentified after one year. All told, there were, again, as of 2019, more than 40,000 sets of human remains listed as unidentified in the U.S., Thanks to modern forensic technology, now in cases where medical examiners are limited by the information that DNA analysis can provide, forensic anthropologists are often able to help identify victims. Specialists in the hard tissues of the body, such as teeth, bones, fingernails, even hair, forensic anthropologists can now tell the story of the deceased by providing a biological profile. This profile includes the sex, age, ancestry, living stature at time of death, and a rough post-mortem interval. They're also able to determine if uh, trauma or disease was present. And they're able to do all this thanks to increased understanding of isotopes. So cool. Uh, The scientific definition of an isotope is this, a form of a chemical element in which the atoms have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. For example, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, all different isotopes of carbon. And what does that really mean? Fuck if I know, I'm not a scientist, but I do know. Thanks to reading some different articles about all this, that different parts of the world have different isotopes and different amounts of various isotopes, that they form a type of uh, geographic fingerprint. And examining the types and concentrations of isotopes in someone's remains allows forensic anthropologists to determine where someone roughly lived, which is crazy. The earliest example I can find of law enforcement using isotopes to try and solve a cold case comes from a government article about this originating in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake County homicide detective Todd Park was in Reno, Nevada, for a conference about serial killers in 2007 when he first heard about what he called the isotope stuff. A colleague at the meeting described the forensic potential of isotope research being done by Isoforensics, a Salt Lake City company, and Park quickly realized that the science might help him identify the victim in a homicide case he'd worked on seven years earlier. Park, a cold case specialist with the Unified Police of Greater Salt Lake, called Jim Elringer, a University of Utah biology professor, an isoforensic senior scientist, and told him about the case of Saltair Sally. In October of 2000, some duck hunters found some of this uh, woman's remains, a cranium, teeth, about two dozen bones, and a, a little uh, scrap of hair. Nothing more in some desolate brushland near Saltair, a resort area on the banks of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, her body maybe been there for a year, maybe two. It was the first case of its kind for isoforensics. The firm scientists conducted isotope ratio analysis on 26 centimeters of the woman's hair provided by the Utah State Office of the Medical Examiner. The length of the hair was important, said isoforensics research scientist Brett Tipple, because it acts like a film strip. Measuring changes in the oxygen isotope ratios along the length of the hair, he said, creates a chronology that helps investigators when they are trying to put together a person's travel history. That's fucking wild. They can do this shit now. Uh, The science behind the measurements is based on the naturally occurring isotopes of oxygen and uh, strontium. Yeah, strontium. Uh, The ratio between two oxygen isotopes, 18O and 16O, reflects the water supply in the region where a person lived. Because the ratio differs slightly in different geographic regions based on geologic, climatic, uh, climatic, 
Environmental factors, these isotopes can be linked to where a person originated. Comparisons of the ratios of two strontium isotopes work in much the same way. Water is the key in creating a travel history from an individual hair because isotopes found in hair are a reflection of the water that people drink, ingested in the case of oxygen and the water in which they bathe or shower, deposited in the case of strontium. We are pretty wet animals, Tipple says. We, as humans, typically get in the shower every day or every evening because water isotope ratios are stored in an individual's hair based on the specific geographic region where the person lives. Hair analysis can reveal a history of the person's location and movement. Tipple, whose research has been supported by the National Institute of Justice since 2011, has been developing databases and models to help accurately link isotope ratios to the geographical region from which they come. Tipple has created water and hair isotope landscapes, or isoscapes, by taking hundreds of water and hair samples from all over the nation. In addition to linking people to various water profiles through their hair, other scientists have created other profiles for atmosphere, the soil, and more, and they can test teeth and bones in addition to hair. Lead isotopic uh, analysis has proved to be a, a very efficient tool for linking remains with areas associated with identifiable amounts of lead pollution. Analysis of mineralized tissues like tooth enamel support the old adage that you are what you eat. Consumption of processed foods makes this a little trickier now, but apparently forensic anthropologists still usually have enough to work with to figure out where you were eating, what you were eating when you were still alive. So hail forensic anthropologists. Help them bring closure to more victims, you know, uh, their families uh, that was previously possible. And I got to wonder what the uh, isotopic analysis of my dad would reveal. One of these days, I'm going to have to fucking get some tranquilizer darts. Just knock him out for a couple hours and run some tests. For the good of humanity. For the, for the safety of our society. Circling back to this particular timeline body, uh, the woman was buried in a Jane Doe grave at a local cemetery way back in 1981. However, she is a Jane Doe no longer. On May 25th, 2021, the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department announced that the identification, or announced the identification 40 years after the Jane Doe was found. She was 32-year-old Karen K. Nippers. Karen Nippers was born in Florida in December of 1948, lived in St. Louis shortly before she was murdered. Investigators, unfortunately, still don't know why she was in Pulaski County on the day she was killed. Uh, So how in the hell was she finally identified? Well, in 2012, Lieutenant Dottie Taylor from the Missouri State Highway Patrol entered Karen's DNA into the National Missing and and Unidentified Persons System database. Detective DJ Reno from the Sheriff's Department had gotten permission to look at the case again. Then in 2015, the wheels of justice, they turned so slow sometimes, but uh, coroner Mikkel Hartness got a court order to exhume Karen's remains and extract, extract DNA. Five years later, in December of 2020, the DNA Doe Project in Sebastopol, California, not founded until 2017, now found a possible relative of Karen's from Alexandria, Virginia. The relative informed detectives that his sister went missing in the early 80s. The relative provided the DNA sample Came up as a fucking match. Here we go. A uh, little more on the DNA Doe Project. It's a nonprofit volunteer organization created to help identify John and Jane Doe's using forensic genealogy. It was just founded in 2017 by Colleen M. Fitzpatrick and Margaret Press. Fitzpatrick has a doctorate in physics, worked as a nuclear physicist for NASA and the Department of Defense. Also founded Identifinders, an organization that uses Y chromosomal testing to identify killers and unsolved murders. So fucking hail Colin Fitzpatrick and press is a novelist who has also worked in computer programming, speech and language consulting. And she started helping her friends and acquaintances find their relatives in 2007 because she's a pretty good sleuth. Hail Margaret Press. As of 2021, the most recent year I can find data for them, this organization has assisted in discovering the identity of more than 50 individuals with 44 cases being publicized as being identified. These are cases that were very hard to solve. February 13th, 1983, another Jane Doe was found alongside Route 250 near Littleton, Wetzel County, West Virginia. The first of the six victims that the Elizabethton, Tennessee high school class focused in on as being a probable victim of one serial killer, the Bible Belt Strangler. The elderly couple who found her thought she was a mannequin at first. The woman had clearly been put there recently because there was snow on the ground, but not on her body. Fresh tire tracks and footprints also indicated that someone had recently dumped her in that location. The police concluded that she had died two days earlier and surprisingly for these kinds of murders was not sexually assaulted. Police believe she was strangled, but an autopsy could not conclusively identify her cause of death. The woman was white, aged 35 to 45, with auburn hair, 5'6", 135 pounds with brown eyes. 
She had what looked like a a C-section scar and another scar on her index finger. Some witnesses described seeing a stocky middle-aged white man near the area where she was found. He may have been driving a 1978 to 1980 two-tone Chevy truck. Holy shit. Not even kidding. My fucking dad used to drive a two-tone Chevy truck, Silverado. I think it was 1979. He loved that truck. I wish I knew what happened to it. Maybe collect as much DNA as possible from it if we can find it. Run through some databases. See what comes up. Hmm. Anyway, it's possible that the woman was last seen alive in Wheeling, West Virginia, either as an employee or a customer at a bar based on some tips to police. She became known as the Wetzel County Jane Doe and was later linked to the Redhead Murders in 1985 and, of course, linked to the Bible Belt Strangler in 2018. Possible that the woman, based on other tips, was a sex worker in Pittsburgh. One investigator believes she might have been connected to a Hare Krishna commune in West Virginia. This fucking commune. This commune is called New Vrindaban, built on over 1,200 acres in northern West Virginia in 1968. Supposedly around 100 people still live there. At its peak in the early 80s, there was around 500 living there, and it seems to have once housed a dangerous sex cult. Around the time this Jane Doe would have lived there, if she did, in the early 80s, according to later press that came out in the mid-80s, Charges of arson, insurance fraud, child molestation, forced prostitution of members, murder, drug running, stockpiling weapons, racketeering, and more leveled against this commune's leadership. Cult, cult, cult. And perhaps a suck for another day. Uh, Investigators had hoped to identify this Jane Doe by the fitted denture she wore. They searched dental records in West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, but were never able to find a match, and she sadly does still remain unidentified. On September 16th, 1984, a third Jane Doe was found along Interstate 40 near West Memphis, Crittenden County, Arkansas, second possible Bible Belt Strangler victim. Hitchhiker found the body 20 miles west of West Memphis. The woman was wearing only a sweater, had also been strangled. She wasn't a redhead, but did have strawberry blonde hair, so red-ish. Uh, the following summer, on June 25th, 1985, Arkansas law enforcement announced they had identified this woman found on I-40 as 28-year-old Lisa Ann Nichols and announced she was linked to the Redhead Murders. Lisa, originally from West Virginia, also went by the names of Lisa Ann Jarvis and Lisa Fuller, and she had long worked as a sex worker. Uh, A Metro Nashville Nashville Vice Squad sergeant told the Tennessean in 1994 that Lisa had, quote, the second longest prostitute record in Nashville and Davidson County. Uh, okay. That's, That's a weird thing to say, right? Like, why not just say sex worker? Why add that she she almost had the record for most prostitution arrests? Uh, it just feels like maybe maybe it wasn't meant to come across that way, but it feels like uh, some victim blaming. Like, maybe not the best shit to say to the press, you know? Gives me a vibe of like, <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, she wasn't just a sex worker. No, she sucked all the dicks. I'm not surprised. This is where she ended up. Uh, Lisa was identified by a jailhouse informant who was also a pimp. On June 26, 1985, the Tennessean reported the pimp who's in a Florida jail told police he last saw Jarvis getting into a tractor trailer September 12, 1984 at a truck stop outside Shearerville. Authorities believe she was killed within 24 hours of when she was last seen working the truck stop. Man, too bad that fucker didn't write down license plates. Uh, if, you know, if he had, they would have nabbed this guy. January 1st, 1985, a fourth Jane Doe was found down an embankment off Interstate 75 near Jellico, Campbell County, Tennessee third suspected Bible Belt Strangler victim. Tourists who were taking some pictures along I-75 found her body. She had been wrapped in a blanket, was bound and gagged, and appeared to have been beaten. The woman's autopsy found that she was strangled and probably died several days before she was found. She was also two to five months pregnant. Her description was listed as a white woman with shoulder-length curly red hair, likely aged 17 to 25, but possibly as old as 30, had green eyes, freckles, several scars on her body, had a partial up upper denture for two false teeth. The woman was found wearing a tan velour blouse and jeans, had no shoes on. On September 6, 2018, over three decades after her body was discovered, this Jane Doe was identified, finally, as 20-year-old Tina Marie McKenney Farmer, a woman from Indiana, just over three months after the presentation given by those Elizabethan Tennessee high school students. Uh, in this case, that did not lead to her identification, though. A lot of additional investigation, uh, investigative work was already being done. By the time they gave that presentation, a uh, 20 year old Tina Marie McKenney farmer was last seen by those who knew her Thanksgiving day, 1984, almost six weeks before she was killed, reported missing soon after Thanksgiving in 1992, Tina's sister, Sandra Price called the Indianapolis police to remind them it had been eight years since Tina went missing 
And she and the rest of the family wanted some fucking answers. Well, they'd have to wait another 26 years. In November of 2016, TBI Special Agent Brandon Elkins resubmitted Tina's clothing and the blanket that was wrapped around her to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab. Semen was found on those items. A DNA profile was entered into CODIS, and they got a match. A man named Jerry Leon Johns, born in 1948. More on this piece of shit in a second. In August of 2018, agents received a tip about a missing persons blog that had featured a photo of Tina Farmer. Tina matched the description of the Campbell County Jane Doe. TBI intelligence analysis, or analyst, excuse me, Amy Emberton found a fingerprint card with Tina's prints. Tina's prints were on file because she was arrested in 1983. In August of 2018, investigators asked Detective Nick Hubbs of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police to gather DNA samples from Tina Farmer's living relatives. Hubbs matched the Tennessee Jane Doe's fingerprints to Tina Farmer. Hubbs said that Tina's family was upset by the news, of course, but also glad she had at least been found. On December 19th, 2019, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation publicly announced that Jerry Leon Johns was very likely Tina Farmer's killer. Investigators believe Johns killed Tina in December of 1984, dumped her body off I-75 near Jellicoe, Tennessee, several days later. Johns was convicted of aggravated kidnapping, assault, and other crimes against a woman he picked up in Knox County, Tennessee, two months after Tina was killed. On December 18th, 2019, a grand jury in Campbell County ruled that Johns would have been indicted for Tina's death if he were still alive. But he died in prison back in December of 2015. This is the guy we are most sure killed one of these poor women. TBI director David Rausch said in a statement, we hope this will help provide long sought answers for Tina Farmer's family. We also want this case to provide hope for other families in our state who are still waiting for answers. Our team will never give up on unsolved cases like this one as long as there are viable leads to follow. Let's rewind back to 1985. Discuss the case of Jerry Leon Johns a little bit more. Was he the Bible Belt Strangler? Jerry Jones, or sorry, sorry, Johns, uh, was a truck driver originally from Rockford, Illinois. Already had a felony criminal record in Mississippi by the time he killed Tina Farmer. Johns ran a small trucking operation called Rebel Trucking Company out of Cleveland, Tennessee. Oh boy. The following information comes from a 2020 WBIR article that, uh, Knox, uh, that Knoxville NBC affiliate WBIR replaced Linda's name with Tasha at the time. Both modern sources, newspaper articles from the 80s use her real name though, so we will. Uh, Linda Shackey was a dancer at the Catch One Club, a notorious adult club north of I-40. On March 5th, 1985, 36-year-old Johns and his brother Wayne went to Catch One. Uh, Looks like this strip club, according to Yelp, just finally closed in the last few years. Johns had a membership card. Linda agreed to go with him to a hotel in Knoxville after she finished work. She agreed to pay 200 bucks for sex. Johns tore $200 bills in half, gave her two halves, promising her the rest at the hotel. Linda arranged for another woman to have sex with Wayne Johns. They all drove their own cars to a local Holiday Inn. Linda hid her money in her vehicle. Johns got an adjoining room to his brother. Johns had asked Linda to give him cocaine and weed. She said she could probably do that. Then at the hotel, this piece of shit claimed he was a Texas Ranger making a fucking drug bust. Gotcha! Showed her a gun. He was, of course, not a Texas Ranger, but he did drive a truck with Texas plates. That made Linda nervous. After Johns and Linda had sex, she took a bath, tried to leave, but when they walked to her car, he forced her to move over so he could drive, and he drove them back to the strip club. After they parked, he ripped Linda's t-shirt into strips, used it to tie up her hands and feet, put a gag in her mouth, threatened to kill her if she tried to leave or scream, and then he drove her down I-40 until he pulled over in a patch of woods. There, he forced Linda out of the vehicle. She asked if he was going to kill her, and he said yes. Linda asked why, and he told her, you become a nuisance. Linda said that Johns was angry because he found out, fucking get this, that she was not a natural redhead. Act like he was going to shoot her, but instead he strangled her. Another fucking uh, tip towards the Bible Belt Stranger with her t-shirt until she lost consciousness. Uh, I think thought she was dead. She wasn't. She woke up in a culvert, crawled out, flagged down another trucker on the interstate, told the trucker and other people who stopped that someone tried to kill her. She was so scared, she begged her rescuers not to kill her as well. Also told troopers uh, what happened informing them that John stole her car and she gave them their uh, room numbers at the hotel. Well, Jerry Lee Johns was then arrested in Knox County, Tennessee, March 6, 1985. A trooper saw John's truck in the Holiday Inn parking lot. He and a deputy saw Linda's car approach the parking lot, then speed off, chase his fucker down on I-40. When he finally stopped, the police found a loaded gun inside his car and found uh, his motel room key, a little over 750 bucks in cash, and his strip club membership card and saw him throw away several hundred dollar bill halves. 
Johns was immediately considered a suspect in the redhead murders. When he was arrested, he was questioned about 20 unsolved murders in Tennessee, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Texas, and Mississippi. Investigators described Johns as an extremely intelligent ex-con who had taken courses in criminal justice and who was quick to mention his interest in the psychology of serial killers during his initial interview. What the fuck? Why would he say that to the police? Oh, oh, wait, silly me. I know because he was fucking crazy. Knox County Detective Larry Johnson told the New Sentinel in 1985, serial killer was about the third thing that came out of his mouth. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, Johns also gave a statement to the paper saying, apparently I fit the mold of what they were looking for. You can't blame them. They've got a lot of unsolved cases all over the country, but they can try all they want. Won't work. I didn't do it. On February 19th, uh, 1986, this calm sociopath was indicted for felon- felonious assault and aggravated kidnapping. Then in February of 86, Lisa sued Johns for physical and emotional suffering. And then Johns, such a piece of shit, sued her fucking back in July. His complaint stated, It is the contention of plaintiff Jerry L. Johns that defendants and her lawyer conspired to perpetrate a fraud upon the plaintiff. Mm-hmm. May 27, 1986, Linda Shack or Shacky, identified Johns as her attacker for a second time at a pretrial hearing. First identified him from a picture shown to her by a detective. Jury selection for John's trial started on March 3rd, 1987. His trial was postponed five times. Finally, a mistrial was declared December of 1986 when a count, uh, court clerk inadvertently read charges that were severed from the case. But they would do another trial. Uh, Linda testified against John's now on March 3rd. John's uh, brother, Wayne, testified that Linda left with another man on the night she was attacked. Not, a, not his brother. Mm-hmm. He claimed he saw her when he got up during the night to just go, you know, innocently get a soda. However, the night of the crime, he told the police he was asleep until they knocked on his door right around 3, 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. He's fucking up. The defense tried to suggest that Linda's boyfriend attacked her when she failed a drug sale. Linda said she didn't see her boyfriend that night. March 5th, 1987, Jerry Lee Johns found guilty of felonious assault with the intent to commit first-degree murder, aggravated kidnapping with a deadly weapon, armed robbery, and reckless driving. And on April 10th, he was sentenced to 108 years in prison. So fuck yeah. Hail Nimrod. Fuck Jerry Leon or Leon Johns. Uh, John's family and friends tried to convince the judge to show mercy during sentencing. Insisting he's, he's a good guy. He and his wife, uh, they, they've been suffering because they just lost their son, which is sad, but doesn't make you do this. After being convicted and sentenced, Johns wrote different petitions insisting the police had the wrong man. Luckily, all of them were ignored. And finally, he would die in prison in December of 2015 at the age of 67. So glad he, uh, he spent the last three decades of his life behind bars. And again, John's one of the strongest, if not the strongest suspect in the redhead murders, also the lead Bible Belt Strangler suspect. However, more murders occurred after he was arrested, meaning he could not be the only killer. And that kind of shoots down the theory of the Elizabeth, Tennessee high school students thinking that one person committed all the Bible Belt Strangler murders. And, uh, and he had sex with the victim, which didn't quite match up with the profile, but oh, well, you know, still a kick-ass stab at a profile. And much of this info was not made public until after they'd given their presentation, by the way. Uh, Early 2020, the TBI was seeing if they could link Johns to other murders. Agent Brandon Elkins told WBIR, at this current time, we have not made any connections anywhere in the nation connecting Johns, specifically by forensic evidence, to another case. But we are definitely open to the possibility that he could have killed before Ms. Farmer and before the victim here in Knox County was assaulted. January 24th, 1985. Now, the fifth woman in this timeline found dead, this time in Olive Branch, Mississippi, less than 10 miles from Memphis, Tennessee. She became known as the DeSoto County Jane Doe. A truck driver on U.S. Highway 78 found her body around 7.30 a.m. She'd been dumped on the highway during the night. The woman was wearing blue jeans and a white blouse. The woman is estimated to be aged 20 to 40, 5'2 to 5'4, 105 to 130 pounds, believed to have been a heavy smoker, had three piercings in each ear and uh, bit down her fingernails. Autopsy was ordered the same day she was found. On January 25th, 1985, DeSoto County officials announced the autopsy findings. The woman was choked with a narrow object. But coroner Jeff Pounder said it would take days or weeks to determine if choking was the exact cause of death. The autopsy showed that she had been strangled, but exact cause of death was never established with 100% certainty. Okay, and, and uh, you know her uh, her killer never found and uh, her body not identified. March 29th, 1985, the remains of a Jane Doe found along I-40 in Waynesville, North Carolina, near the Tennessee border. Our sixth dead body today. 
This Jane Doe not uh, not identified until 2012 when DNA and dental records identified her as 27-year-old Priscilla Ann Blevins. Priscilla had reddish blonde hair. She went missing a full decade earlier in July of 1975. Left behind her family, Kathy Blevins Howe, uh, uh, her parents, Sadie and Bob, who died in 2001 and 2002. July 7th, 1975, Priscilla's roommate saw her at their Charlotte home. She'd already left home by the age of 17. Pretty good indication that things at home not the best. People searched for her right away after she left, but her case quickly went cold. 25 years after she went off the grid, Kathy got involved in her sister's case in 2000, started speaking with Detective Lee Tuttle from the Charlotte Meckle, Mecklenburg excuse me, PD. Tuttle collected a mitochondrial DNA sample from Kathy, which was entered into a national database. On October 18, 2012, Tuttle was notified that the Jane Doe's remains, which were recently entered into the database, matched the DNA sample. The identification was then confirmed through dental records. In October of 2012, the Charlotte Mecklenburg PD contacted Kathy Howe, informed her that her sister's remains were held at the state medical examiner's office in Chapel Hill. They had been in storage for over 20 years. Man, good for them for never fully giving up. Kathy told the Huffington Post it was just unbelievable, and it still is. It was equal parts of relief, surprise, sorrow, and joy at the opportunity to finally bring my sister home. Right, And that speaks to how emotionally important it is to the families of cold case victims to solve these crimes. Even if the killer is very likely dead or will never be identified, so important to the healing process to at least have some kind of closure. Right? Good on everyone involved in these investigations. A lot of good people doing a lot of good shit. The whole field of forensic investigation and analysis. What a cool field to be a part of. Guessing a lot of, you know, badass meat sacks are doing this work. I love it. Uh, Kathy Howe was told an autopsy was performed on Priscilla, but nothing was positively determined. She still doesn't know the results or whether or not her death was considered foul play. March 31st, 1985, the remains of a red-headed Jane Doe are found along I-24 in Pleasant View, Cheatham County, Tennessee. Seventh body to turn up in this timeline. Those students, fourth possible Bible Belt Strangler victim. A lone serial killer still could have killed five out of the six victims they looked at. A couple driving on I-24 stopped because their car overheated. They were trying to get water from a creek at the bottom of the embankment and then found bones and clothing about 75 yards off the interstate. A fucking random day for those people. Uh, skeletal human remains, bloody shreds of clothing found along the roadside. April 1st, local deputies in the corner went to the site, found a skull, bones, and uh, a knit sweater and a blouse with blood on it, a black bra, designer jeans, and thermal underwear. The clothing appeared to have fallen in a line from the interstate to the bottom of the embankment. There was also a lot of reddish brown, medium length hair scattered near the bones. This body also still has yet to be identified. April 1st, still in 1985, another Jane Doe found inside a refrigerator. Fuck. Along Route 25 in Gray, Knox County, Kentucky. The eighth body. Bible Belt Strangler victim. Possible victim. Number five. The woman was found that morning by two men who were looking for appliance parts in the dump off US two, uh, hi, or the U.S. Highway 25E, four miles southwest of Corbin, Kentucky. She was found naked except for two pairs of socks and two pendant necklaces. One pendant was a heart. The second was a gold eagle. And uh, just real quick, super random, fucked up. <laughs> but I do want to share this. I was I was pretty tired when I was uh, first going through all these notes. And the, the information on this uh, particular topic is so fucking scattered. Like there's no like good primary source. You just got to grab like newspaper articles and kind of like, you know, pile it all together. And uh, which is a little more mentally taxing than like an, like an easier kind of narrative where the information's already been gathered somewhere. But anyways, a little tired, a little hungry. So a little spacey. And when I came across the note about two pairs of socks, my brain, for whatever reason, did not put both of them on her feet. My possibly damaged brain put two, <laughs> two socks on her feet and then the other two on her hands. Like, why would I ever fucking think that? Like, for a, just for like a moment, it's like my brain is like, was wondering, like when she was abducted, it, like, like she was in the middle of a fucking puppet show. Or like her abductor, before killing her, made her perform some kind of puppet show. What, a, what an especially odd, ser- then I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like what an especially odd serial killer that would be. Someone who kidnaps women and then forces them to put on weird sock puppet shows. Uh, do it, do it, say it. Uh, Tom Wilhock- Wilcox is the strongest, smartest, most handsome man who ever lived. Not you, God damn it. Uh, make Mrs. Puppernickel say it. Uh, sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know who the fuck Mrs. Pumpernickel is. Just l- let me go. Shut up. Mrs. Pumpernickel is on your right hand with the lipstick, obviously. Okay. 
Tom Wilcox is the strongest, smartest, most handsome man who ever lived. Uh, that's good. That, that's good. And uh, now make Mr. Bad Danny Wilcox uh, say what he's supposed to say. Uh, he sure is. I wish I was the strongest, smartest, most handsome man who ever lived, but I'm a stupid bad daddy who can't even go poopy on a potty. Yes, yes, that's good. I love the show. I really, I really love the show. Uh, keep it on. I might let you put your clothes back on. That is a terrifying scenario to imagine, actually. I just, I just wanted to not have that only exist in my head. Uh, anyway. Like some of the other victims, and I do realize that sounds like Woody. Woody is apparently my fucking brain's uh, stock puppet voice. Uh, anyway, like some of the other victims, this woman had reddish brown hair, hazel eyes, thought to be between 25 and 32, 4'11", and weighed around 100 pounds. The woman's preliminary autopsy indicated that she suffocated. She'd been dead between two to four hours when she was found and had no drugs or alcohol in her blood, had no bruises or marks indicating she fought off an attacker, no scratches inside the fridge to show that she had tried to escape. Uh, the Knox County Deputy Coroner believed that, thankfully, she was put in the fridge after she had died. Strangely, again, considering the norm in these types of cases, there was no evidence of sexual assault. Uh, there were, sadly, signs that she had recently given birth. The woman was last seen around 2 a.m. the day she died at King's Truck Stop, I-75 in Corbin. Witnesses reported she was looking for a ride to North Carolina. The owner of a funeral home in nearby Barberville received over 600, excuse me, uh, 600 requests from people in different states asking to view the body. Uh, the community of Barberville donated a casket and a grave to the unknown woman. Also helped uh, hold a proper funeral for her. So that's pretty fucking cool. Good on them. Well, October 1st, 2018, over 33 years after her body was found, the Kentucky State Police announced that this Jane Doe was identified as Epsi Regina Black Dash Pilgrim. So Black Pilgrim from Spindale, North Carolina. Investigators matched her DNA to her daughter, who reported that her mother went missing when she was just six weeks old. Epsi also had four other children. Uh, in the summer of 2017, the FBI re-examined Epsi's case, according to Detective Aaron Frederick of the Kentucky State Police. The FBI informed them that they recently found a match for a fingerprint on the fridge. It was later determined that the print was unrelated to the case, but it led to a re-examination of old case files. Frederick had never heard of the case before. He looked over the file again saw that there had been no lead since 1992. This case was cold, cold, cold. They put together a press release, which went out in July of 2017. On October 18th, 2017, Elizabeth Pilgrim, Epsi's now adult daughter, reached out at Knox County Judge Executive J.M. Hall, or two, said that she believed she may be the daughter of the Knox County Jane Doe. Her mother, Epsi Regi uh, Regina Black Pilgrim, had went missing shortly before the Jane Doe was found. Judge Hall told WYMT, she was just overwhelmed by what she had seen in the papers, and she really thinks this could be what she's been looking for for so many years. In October of 2017, Elizabeth's aunt had found a post about an unidentified murder victim. Uh, Elizabeth told WBIR when she saw the picture, she had a feeling and called the police department. Elizabeth noticed that the composite picture looked a lot like her mom. Elizabeth's brother saw on, the, on a Facebook post that the Jane Doe had a birthmark on her left ankle. Their mom had a birthmark on her left ankle and also wore the same exact necklace shown in the photos. Detective Frederick traveled to North Carolina to collect some DNA evidence. Took over a year to get the test results, right? Lab backed up. But Kentucky law enforcement finally learned that their Jane Doe was Epsi Black Pilgrim. Uh, this is what allowed the Kentucky police to reopen the investigation. They learned that, uh, I think it's Espy, sorry. Espy was last seen in the middle of the night at a Kentucky truck stop seeking a ride to North Carolina. A witness remembered someone calling on the CB radio and offering her a ride. And before moving on, can we talk for a second about her last hyphenated name, Black Pilgrim? I mean, that is a strange combo, right? I mean, there actually were a few Black Pilgrims. Not talked about much, but they existed, serving in the Plymouth militia by the 1640s. Still, not what almost anyone thinks of, and this is a white woman. I just feel like if you're a white woman and someone's calling out, Black Pilgrim, party of one, and then you get up, they're going to get some stares. Uh, just two days after the discovery of Epsi's remains... Uh, on sorry, I I, I think I auto corrected. To, it is E P S Y. Just not a name, not a name I've ever seen before in any fucking form. So just throwing my brain off. But Epsi, maybe you know an Epsi. I don't. Uh, they just, three just two days after the discovery of Epsi's remains on April third, nineteen eighty five, the skeletal remains of a young girl are found in the Big Wheel Gap area of Elk Valley in Campbell County, Tennessee, near a strip mine. Forensic anthropologists determined that she was likely a white female between the age of ten and fifteen. This timeline's ninth body, a passerby found her. Only 32 bones, including her skull, were found. 
The skull was complete enough for investigators to attempt facial reconstruction. A necklace and bracelet made out of buttons were found near the remains, along with a pair of size five boots, some clothing scraps, not knowing if these items belonged to the girl or not. Her cause of death still undetermined, but there are similarities to the other cases. For many, many years, this Jane Doe was simply known as Baby Girl. A forensic analysis of the girl's remains determined she was probably not from Tennessee, maybe from the Midwest. Fucking isotopes, isotopes, don't lie. I don't think. I still really don't know much about isotopes, but trusting people who do study them. August 30th, 2022, the TBI announced that the skeletal remains of the child found in Campbell County, Tennessee, were finally identified. Over 32 years of being found, right? Incredible. In 2007, a sample of the remains was submitted to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. Her profile was entered into CODIS, the national and the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. Uh, nothing came back from that search. Luckily, it was not the investigator's final effort. In 2013, a TBI agent and intelligence analyst, analyst, why do I keep saying, I don't know what I'm saying, uh, but analyst, reviewed the case to look for new leads, still nothing, but still not done. Last year in 2022, assisted by the University of Tennessee Anthropology Department, a sample of her remains was now sent to a private lab called Othram Incorporated, where scientists completed forensic genetic genealogy testing. In June, Othram found a possible relative who was living in Indiana. TBI then located several potential family members in Lafayette, who confirmed that a member of their family went missing in 1978. Agents obtained familial DNA standards for possible siblings, which were given to the TBI crime lab and entered into CODIS. In August, the UNTCHI, University of North Texas Center for Human Identification, positively identified that Jane Doe as Tracy Sue Walker. She went missing from Lafayette, Indiana, 1978. Last seen at the Tippecanoe Mall with a friend. Her mom reported her as a runaway when she disappeared. August 31st, 2022, Tippecanoe County, Indiana Sheriff Bob Goldsmith said that Tracy Sue Walker's case became a priority after all those years. Said, we are going to be meeting this afternoon with Lafayette police detectives. We're going to get the information they have. We've already been on the phone with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations. We will be assisting them with any follow-up that they need. So on our end, the case is back open. I don't know what that's going to look like moving forward. Goldsmith admitted that they were not previously aware of the case, saying, I can't speak for the guys back in 78. Things were totally different. We're talking about typewriters and different forms. Now everything's in a computer. When you do something, you should do a supplemental follow-up. Tracy was only 15 when she went missing and was killed. Likely murdered back in 1978. Hard to say exactly due to the condition her remains were found in. How many other skeletons like hers are still scattered around America waiting to be found? April 14th, 1985, a young Jane Doe found on I-81 or just off I-81 near exit 44 in Greenville, Green County, Tennessee. Body number 10. Sixth and final Bible Belt Strangler victim according to the students. A man and his son came across the body when taking a shortcut to a pond Jane Doe was missing her clothing, had died approximately three weeks earlier, six to eight weeks pregnant, had miscarried shortly before her death. A preliminary autopsy found that she had been stabbed but died from a blow to the head. So, so fucking sad, just such a violent end. Investigators estimated that she was likely age 14 to 20, possibly even up to 25, 5'4 to 5'6, weighing between 130 and 140 pounds. Had light brown or blonde hair with red highlights, which linked her to the redhead murders. Authorities initially hoped they would identify her by her fingerprints, but no luck. And she remained, like most of these victims, a Jane Doe for decades. In 2006, a sample of her remains submitted to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. They developed a DNA profile, entered it into CODIS. Uh, and a dozen years later, in November of 2018, UNTCHI confirmed they had a match. The Jane Doe was 17-year-old Elizabeth Lamott, a girl from Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, Elizabeth went missing from Manchester back on November 22, 1984. Prior to her disappearance, she'd been placed at the Youth Development Center, a 24-hour secure treatment facility that offered intensive treatment for New Hampshire's detained and committed youth. Elizabeth left on furlough on the day she went missing and then just never came back to the facility. Uh, her case was discharged from the YDC on her 18th birthday, July 27, 1985, even though she had not returned to the facility. Strangely, or maybe just sadly, Elizabeth was not reported as a missing person to the Manchester PD until 2017. Soon afterwards, the police received a tip in response to the Attorney General's press conference with the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit in January of 2018. And the tip led them to believe that she may have been murdered and also to a possible murder suspect, Robert, a.k.a. Bob Evans. 
Before we look into this huge piece of shit, the serial killer, uh, first let's find out how she was identified. Two of Elizabeth's brothers then provided a DNA sample, which was submitted to NAMIS, National Missing and Unidentified Person System, to find out if Elizabeth was one of thousands of Jane Doe's from around the country. November 13th, 2018, the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification notified the Manchester PD that they matched the sibling DNA to the remains of a Jane Doe found in Tennessee, 1985. Her remains had been at the University of Tennessee since that year. Elizabeth had brown hair and uh, with red highlights again, which linked her, of course, to the redhead murders. Now for the main suspect in her murder, this Bob Evans, fucking founder of the family-style American restaurant chain, maker of delicious sausage and banana nut bread. When that motherfucker wasn't whipping up fork tender pot roasts, slow roasted turkey and dressing family dinners, dang hot chicken meals, hot cakes, and double crusted apple pies, he was sexually assaulting and murdering young women across the Midwest. You heard it here first. And you heard it here first because it never happened. But the suspect's name was Bob Evans. Just like the restaurant that I do enjoy. Except that wasn't his real name. Just one of many he went by. This son of a bitch went by so many aliases, he became known as the chameleon killer. Real name, Terry Peter Rasmussen, an American serial killer. Uh, Terry Peter, unfortunate combo, uh, was believed before he died in prison in 2010 to be responsible for the murders of the Allenstown Four, a woman and three children found in barrels in 1985 and 2000. DNA evidence would connect him to these killings in 2017. Rasmussen was born in Colorado, December 23rd, 1943. Dropped out of high school in Phoenix, Arizona his sophomore year. Served in the Navy from 1961 to 1967. Following the Navy, uh, moved to Hawaii briefly to work at his parents' shoe shop. Excuse me. Uh, Rasmussen got married in Hawaii and then moved back to Phoenix with his family. He and his wife would have twin daughters. The family would soon move to California, then back to Phoenix. And shortly thereafter, the arrest began. Rasmussen was arrested for aggravated assault in April of 1973. Uh, uh, April 30th, 1973, he was arrested in Phoenix on a fugitive from justice charge. June of 75, arrested a second time for aggravated assault, and his wife left him shortly after he was arrested, and he would be a absentee dad shortly thereafter. December of 1975, uh, 1975 Rasmussen visited his now ex-wife and kids, unannounced in Payson, Arizona. He was accompanied by an unidentified woman, said he was living in the Casa del Rey apartments in Ingleside, Texas, and then his family would never see him again after that visit. Around this time, Rasmussen became involved with a woman named Marlise Elizabeth Honeychurch a divorced mother of two. Marlise might have been the woman who was with him in Payson. Uh, Marlise was born in Connecticut in 1954. Her first daughter, Marie Elizabeth Vaughn, born in 1971, and her second daughter, Sarah Lynn McWaters, born in 1977. Marlise was last seen by her family during Thanksgiving 1978 at her mom's house in La Puente, California. She introduced her family to Rasmussen, who reportedly used his real name at that time when he met him. Marlies got into some kind of heated argument with her mom during the visit, left with her kids and Rasmussen and was never seen again. Marlies' sister, Paula Hodges, doesn't remember the argument, but told ABC 2020 decades later, my mom might have said something to her as, he's too old for you. Why are you with him? She went with Terry. They left, never called, never contacted nobody, just disappeared. Marlies was only 24 when she went missing. Rasmussen was 35. And the police believe she died a couple years later when she was 26 or 27. Authorities believe uh, Marie was eight to 10 years old when she died and Sarah was just two to three years old when she died, the, the daughters there. They were missing persons for many years before being finally identified. In 1978 or 1979, Rasmussen started to use the name Bob Evans to work as an electrician. In January of 1980, uh, Elizabeth Evans, a woman who has never been identified, signed a certified letter in Manchester, New Hampshire. Terry Rasmussen was associated with her uh, as far as address. Now, this Elizabeth was likely not Elizabeth Lamott from Manchester, the woman associated with the redhead murders, because she would have only been 13 or 14 here. Possible, but very unlikely. Uh, could have been Marlise Elizabeth Honeychurch, though. Probably was. February of 1980, Rasmussen was arrested in Manchester for issuing a bad check. He used the name Robert T. Evans, said his wife was Elizabeth Evans. A few months later in May, he was arrested in Manchester for theft of services. He used the name Bob Evans again. Still listed his, uh, listed his wife as Elizabeth. But in October, when he was arrested for illegally diverting electrical current, Bob Evans did not list a spouse on his arrest report. November of 1981, Rasmussen and his new girlfriend, 23-year-old Denise Bowden, a woman from Manchester, uh, went missing just after Thanksgiving along with Denise's six-month-old daughter. Denise, never been seen since. More on her daughter in a bit. 
Rasmussen showed up again in 1984 as an employee at an electrical company in Los Alamitos, California. Arrested for a DUI in May of 1985 in Cypress, California, now using the name Curtis Mayo Kimball. Several months later, November of 1985, a barrel is found near Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. Uh, the barrel contained the remains of an adult female and a female child. 11-year-old Jesse Morgan and his friends were, they found the barrel first, a few months earlier. He later told ABC 2020, we were playing a game of hide and seek. I was approached by one of the kids in the group that he had come upon a barrel out in the middle of the woods, which was off the trail. It was just odd that the barrel was out there. It was a slightly rusted dark blue barrel. It's a blue 55-gallon steel drum. Just kind of sitting out there in the woods. The brother that found the barrel went over to it, tried to lift the top off the barrel, and when he did, we were just hit with a smell that was absolutely putrid. One of the brothers just pushed the barrel over, and we watched the barrel fall on its side. The guy jumped on my four-wheeler, and we booted out of there, and that was the last time we saw the barrel. Then on November 10th, 1985, an officer received instructions to meet a hunter at the edge of the woods in Bear Brook. The hunter reported finding the same barrel in the woods with bones inside. And investigators determined that the woman and child died of blunt force trauma to their heads. Same year, a private investigator was hired to find Marlise and her kids, but they were unsuccessful. January of 1986, Rasmussen was now living and working in Santa Cruz County in California under the name Gordon Jensen. That June, he abandoned Denise Bowden's daughter and fled. Rasmussen had claimed that, quote, Lisa was his biological daughter. And Lisa was taken into protective custody in 1986 after a failed adoption attempt between Rasmussen and a California couple. So this fucker tried to make some money selling the baby whose mom he had murdered. In March of 1989, Rasmussen now arrested on warrants for child abandonment, sentenced to three years in prison. He's paroled in 1990. May 9th, 2000, a second barrel was found near the Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown. This barrel contained the remains of two female children, ages two to four and one to three. Following month, June 8th, the unidentified adult female and child are found, that they were found in 1985 were exhumed for DNA testing. In June of 2002, Rasmussen's girlfriend, uh, Yoon Soon Jun, now disappears from Richmond, California. Uh, Yoon Soon Jun was a chemist from California in her mid-40s. About two years before she went missing, she had introduced her family to her boyfriend, Larry Vanner. Renee Rose, Jun's friend, later told ABC 2020, he didn't even look healthy. His face was gray. He smoked constantly. Larry would just grab and gobble up everything on the table and belch and eat more and then go sit on the couch. What a fucking champion. How annoying that a walking turd like Larry could land a successful chemist. And she did look healthy, super cute. Uh, so sad how many people settle in relationships like this. How is being alone worse than being with some gray-faced, chain-smoking, lazy shit face? Looking at pics of Larry, but really Terry, uh, he was a long ways from the realm of anyone tossing the word handsome in his direction, in my opinion. Considering how he felt about women in the sense that he kept fucking killing them, based on Renee's uh, description, he sure didn't seem like a nice guy either. Never seemed to have any kind of high-paying job. What redeeming qualities did this shitbag have? Dynamite in bed? I don't get it. Apparently, he was charming. Ugh. Uh, according to Renee, when June went missing, Larry said that she was... Uh, either taking care of her mom or getting some therapy or later that, uh, you know, she decided she didn't want him in her life anymore and, you know, just, just left and he didn't know where she was. Well, Renee didn't buy any of this shit and told him that she wanted to speak to her friend or she was going to the sheriff and she did contact the police. Detective Roxanne Grunheed will follow up on Renee's phone call and uh, talk about her experience later, speaking with Rasmussen, saying, he was polite and soft-spoken and very smart. And with his twinkly blue eyes, he could get somebody to maybe trust him. All we were really trying to do was determine where Yoon Soon was and if she was okay. And he wasn't being cooperative with that at all. Maybe it's those fucking baby blues that lured the ladies in. I still think he looks like a turd. Uh, when the police soon searched Larry Vanner's home in California, Grunheed and another detective found a massive pile of cat litter in a crawl space, like four to five feet around, about three feet high. Uh, there was also an axe in the crawl space. They started digging into the litter and then pretty soon they find a mummified human foot. And, uh, you know, then they, uh, they left nothing to see there. They just figured the cat had pooped it out. You know, most of the time cats eat cat food. Everyone knows that. And they, uh, poop out little cat turds. Sometimes big cats swallow human feet whole and poop it out in the same way. You know how it is. No, of course they didn't think that. Uh, they thought they found the foot of a murder victim in the hat. And then they found the rest of the body. The body was identified as Yoon Soon Jun. She had died of blunt force trauma to the head. Detective Grunheed confirmed that a man matching Larry Vanner's description purchased 10 bags of cat litter from a pet store. So he looks a wee bit guilty. And then he's arrested in November of 2002. In June of 2003, he's sentenced to 15 years to life after pleading guilty to June's murder. Then in August of 2003, DNA 
uh, DNA testing confirmed that Rasmussen was not the biological father to Lisa, that kid he abandoned in California. The San Bernardino Sheriff's Department now started a case to find Lisa's family. She was in her early 20s by this point. A genealogist found Lisa's maternal grandfather, Armand Bowden. And they learned that Lisa's birth name was Don Bowden. Her mom, Denise Bowden, right? Another murder victim, obviously, in all likelihood. A woman last seen with Terry. December of 2010, Rasmussen would die of natural causes at High Desert Prison in Susanville, California at the age of 67 before any more murders could be connected to him. Uh, before any more murders connected to him, excuse me, could be tried in court. In July of 2016, San Bernardino County contacted New Hampshire about Rasmussen. In October of that year, DNA testing confirmed that Rasmussen was the biological father of the older girl found in the second black uh, barrel uh, back in Allenstown. In January of 2017, authorities announced that they believe Rasmussen to be responsible for at least six deaths. Denise Bowden, the woman and three girls found in the barrels, and Yoon Jun. The police also feared that he had probably killed the biological mother of the unidentified girl found in the barrel who was not related to him. The woman's identity or whereabouts, still unknown. It wasn't until August 18, 2017, that Terry Peter Rasmussen's true identity was revealed. Before this, he had only been known in the press as Bob Evans or by other aliases. November 2017, authorities released a new mugshot, hopeful that someone would recognize him, come forward with new info about his murderous activities. Well, that same month, a professional researcher, Rebecca Heath, with an interest in missing persons, found an Ancestry.com message board with a post about Sarah McWaters, uh, Marlise's daughter. The person posting about Sarah said they were obsessed with her case. She connected with a woman in an online message board who was looking for her missing family members, a woman and her daughters. Their ages and locations matched Marlise and her children. She told Rebecca that her missing family member was once married to a man named Rasmussen. She didn't know who Rasmussen was, but luckily Rebecca did. And now she submitted all this to the authorities. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was then made aware of this new information. Now family interviews could confirm that Marlise was last seen at a party with Rasmussen in November of 1978. Meanwhile, investigative genetic genealogist Barbara Ray Venter working on developing a DNA profile of the unknown Rasmussen victims. According to Ray Venter, based on Rasmussen's timeline, it seemed likely that his biological daughter was born in Texas, possibly on the Gulf Coast, if Rasmussen was working on an oil rig around that time, as was suspected. On June 6, 2019, authorities revealed they had solved one more piece of this puzzle. They discovered the identities of three of the females found in the barrels at Bear Brook. The adult was Marlise Elizabeth Honeychurch, and the girls were her two daughters, uh, Marie Elizabeth Vaughn and Sarah Lynn McWaters. February of 2020, authorities announced that they learned that they are that the still unidentified girl was mostly Caucasian with a small amount of Asian, Black, and American Indian ancestry and was born between 1975 and 1977. She had wavy brown hair between three foot three and three foot nine, slight overbite. In January of 2021, the Louisiana State Police, thanks to a bunch of genetic sleuthing, announced that the unidentified girl and her mom were likely descendants of Thomas Dead Horse Mitchell. Born in 1836, or William Livings, born in 1820, uh, 1826. The little girl would be uh, five times or six times, uh, would be the five times or six times great grandchild of these men. Believed that the mother's relatives are from Pearl River County, Mississippi. Thomas Dead Horse Mitchell was a Civil War veteran, got his nickname because he hid under a dead horse uh, during a battle. Mitchell was born in New Orleans and died in Pearl River County, Mississippi. William Joseph Livings, born in Alabama, died in Pearl River County, Mississippi, 1901. Uh, June of 2019, local Manchester, New Hampshire, ABC News outlet, WMUR, talked to Andrea Steers, a daughter of Terry Rasmussen. Andrea said that when she learned her dad was a serial killer and that he killed her half-sister, she gave up drinking and marijuana because she didn't want to be like him. I appreciate that sentiment, Andrea, but I don't think that's how it works. Uh, despite the old claims of reefer madness, weed does not make you a killer. Uh, decreases the odds, I would think, of anything. Uh, Andrea also told the outlet she had memories of a little girl. Andrea was four when she last saw her dad, claimed she met the little unidentified girl around the last time she saw Rasmussen. Steers and her siblings called the girl Anita Moon. She thinks she was half Asian and random. She thinks that Rasmussen killed her because she didn't look like him. So that's a fucking weird little uh, road there with uh, one of the victims. Transitioning back to the redhead murders, investigations into Elizabeth's death and the possible connection with Rasmussen are ongoing. I wanted to include this case because I feel like there are a lot of details that could be more than a coincidence, such as the connection to Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, and how Elizabeth died of blunt force trauma to the head. Elizabeth's killer, sadly, is still unknown. April 20th, uh, April 20th, sorry, 1985, another Jane Doe found dead in Wrightville, Pulaski County, Arkansas. 
Dead body number 11 when not counting the other women and children killed by killers like Terry Peter Rasmussen. She was 30 to 40 years old, five foot three with strawberry blonde hair. But the woman had previously fractured her left femur, cause of death, still unknown, very little info in that case. April 24th, 1985. Law enforcement from five states meets at the TBI headquarters in Nashville to compare notes on the redhead murders. Stephen Watson, deputy director of the TBI, told the Associated Press that time, We are going to sit down and talk about these homicides that each jurisdiction has had and try to figure out how to proceed. Agent David Davenport added, The problem is these women are mostly hitchhikers or prostitutes with no strong family ties. Nobody's looking for them. Most times, nobody cares. Investigators decided to ask the FBI to help determine if the murders were committed by one person. At this point, there were nine to 10 female victims linked together. Steve Watson told the press that they were emphasizing identifying the victims before finding a suspect. According to Watson, each jurisdiction would continue working on their cases and would submit their info to the TBI, which would share information among all five states. Up to 11 victims have been labeled redhead murders, victims uh, by the press. The 11 victims have already listed. But Watson said they weren't certain about the number of victims or that one person was even responsible. Watson noted that only three victims were true redheads. At least five were strangled. All were found along major highways, but some were found naked, others closed. Several had engaged in sexual activity before they, before they died. Others had not. The victims did all seem to be from areas distant to where they were actually found, a theory supported by a lack of identifications. At the time, Watson refused to comment on Jerry Leon John's connection to the case, while Knox County Chief Detective John Maples did tell the AP he didn't consider John's a suspect. Jumping over two years ahead now. August 29th, 1997, sanitation workers find the burned remains of another Jane Doe, body number 12. Behind several dumpsters on I-58, about two and a half miles south of Kingston, Roan County, Tennessee. No one had uh, been reported missing in Kingston or Roan County, but local investigator Daryl Sermons told the press with the interstate going through the county, she could be from anywhere. This woman was white, 25 to 35 years old, 5 foot 8, 125 to 135 pounds, medium brown hair. She had silicon breast implants, had once been shot in the neck, bullets still lodged in her fucking spine, but that was not her cause of death. It was an old injury. How sad. Right When she died, not this woman's first encounter with extreme violence. Her identity remains unknown, as does her killer. December 16th, 1988, yet another Jane Doe found on uh, in Rising Fawn, Georgia, along the east side of northbound I-59, about five miles from the Georgia-Alabama state line. Body 13. She had been strangled. In the mid-2000s, when this case was re-examined, investigators found more evidence, sent it to the FBI lab, where uh, analysts uh, developed a victim DNA profile, entered it into the missing persons DNA database. 2015, the case was re-examined again. Now a Georgia Bureau of Investigation forensic artist did new clay renderings and composites for an age progression. The GBI also contacted the FBI about using a new type of genealogy that had helped solve other cold cases. Seven years later, this extra effort finally pays off. March 24th, 2022, the GBI reports that the unidentified woman uh, is 19-year-old, or sorry, was 19-year-old Stacy Lynn Charhorsky. Uh, Stacy was reported missing in Michigan, January 17th, 1989, by her mom. Her mom last heard from her September 15th, 1988. Stacy said she was traveling to Flint, Michigan from North Carolina. In 2010, detectives from the Norton Shores, Michigan Police Department collected a fingerprint card from relatives, which led to Stacy's identification after Georgia authorities contacted them. Half a year later, September 6, 2022, the GBI wrote a news release that Henry Frederick Wise was now suspected in the death of Stacy Chahorsky. An unknown male's DNA had been found at the crime scene back in 88, couldn't be matched to anyone at that time. Based on the body's location, investigators thought a truck driver was involved. After Stacy was identified, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation asked the FBI to help in identifying a male suspect. DNA was sent to Othram Incorporated. Their scientists used genome sequencing to develop a genealogical profile. June of 2022, using the new profile, FBI genealogists developed some leads and the GBI began to interview potential family members and obtain DNA swabs for comparison. That'd be so fucking weird to get like a phone call from the FBI or some lab associated with the FBI and they just want to like uh, ask you some questions, you know, maybe get a DNA sample, not because they're looking into you, but because they're looking into some like random distant relative of yours. Uh, well, this all led, to, I, I've been waiting for that call, you know, for years, you know, just, uh, <laughs> what do you do? What, it, where was my dad? No, this all led to establishing Henry Frederick Wise, also known as Hoss. Hoss Wise is the main suspect. His DNA was found at the crime scene. So good chance he was her killer. 
Well, Haas had a criminal record in Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina for theft, assault, and obstruction of police uh, and obstruction of a police officer. I found a picture of Haas online, and he did look like a dude known as Haas. Uh, looks like a character out of the uh, original Dukes of Hazard, like Bo and Luke Dukes' mechanic buddy Cooter Davenport's underling or something. Like he like he worked at a local scrapyard where Cooter got his spare parts. Maybe uh, sometimes did some dirt from Boss Hog. Well, Haas would have been 34 years old in 1988. He was a truck driver for a North Carolina trucking company. So that fits. Often drove from Chattanooga to Birmingham to Nashville. Also was a stunt driver. I fucking knew he looked like a Dukes of Hazard character. Right? I thought the uh, Dukes of Hazard shit before I knew about the stunt driving. In May of 1999, while trying to pull off a stunt, this fucker burned to death after his car caught on fire at the Myrtle Beach Speedway in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina when he was 43. So, you know... Sucks that they uh, weren't able to put him in prison for the murder, but uh, pretty cool that he burned alive. Backing up now to the murder timeline. May 7th, 1990, another Jane Doe found in Maysville, Arkansas, off Highway 102 near the Oklahoma and Missouri state lines. Body number 14. She will only be known as the Benton County Jane Doe for over three decades. Several bones and what looked like a shot, uh, looked like shotgun wadding found at the crime scene. Number four buckshot pellets found under the victim's skull. A neighbor reported seeing a fire in the area back in February, but they uh, never checked it out because they thought it was just someone burning trash. Investigators believe that someone ran over the victim or the bone to try and make identification difficult or impossible, and that the victim was set on fire after she was shot. My God. Uh, There were not enough remains left for a reconstruction. Victim believed to be between 25, 35 years old, between 5'6 and 5'10. Over 32 years later, October 25th, 2022, the Benton County Sheriff's Office held a media conference to announce they had recently identified multiple homicide victims through genetic sleuthing, one of whom was 28-year-old Donna Sue Nelton, found dead in May of 1990. Evidence submitted to the Arkansas Crime Lab in February of 1995, or was submitted then, but they didn't have uh, enough, uh, you know, technology to identify her at the time. Uh, 13 years later, her remains sent to the University of North Texas. October 2008, mitochondrial DNA profile created, submitted to NAMIS, uh, that National Missing and Unidentified Person System we mentioned. Case review was completed in 2017. Then in March of 2021, authorities met with Othram Incorporated. Company had developed a DNA profile and identified one of Donna's distant relatives. On August 13th, 2022, the police contacted the relative. They didn't know about a missing family member, but they did give a family history and names of other relatives. Two weeks later, the authorities find a relative who confirmed that a family member did go missing. They collected DNA to compare to uh, the Jane Doe, and it was a positive match. Donna Sue Nelton, last seen in the fall of 89. Following her disappearance, authorities investigated her boyfriend, George Alvin Bruton, for various offenses. Uh, Bruton had a serious criminal record, or Bruton, perhaps, uh, B-R-U-T-O-N. But Bruton was captured in Fort Smith, Arkansas, December 14th, 1979, was wounded while trying to elude an FBI stakeout at his house. FBI agents shot at him, seriously wounded him after he hit an FBI vehicle with his truck and also shot at an agent. Bruton was wanted at the time for two murders in Kansas City, Missouri, and for taking two hostages and also wounding two officers in Utah. Oh, and Bruton was also wanted in connection with a 1965 bank robbery and a 1975 grocery store robbery. He was actually uh, one of the FBI's 10 most wanted. This fucker, before all this, had already spent six years in the U.S. penitentiary in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, for concealing explosives and possession of an unregistered firearm. He and another inmate named Stephen Scott Panel broke out of Leavenworth. He took hostages at a home in Utah in December of 1978, escaped after a fucking gunfight. Pinnell captured a few days later. He wasn't. Moved to Kansas City, where he would live with a prison associate, 39-year-old Michael Walker and his girlfriend, 20-year-old Lisa Holmes. Lisa and Michael then vanished, last seen leaving their apartment February 9th, 1979. Lisa was from Folly Beach, South Carolina. She was reported missing after she left a family wedding in Charleston to go back to Kansas City. Told her family she was only staying long enough to get her things. And then, of course, uh, they don't see her again. February 27th, Michael Walker was found fatally shot in his vehicle in an apartment complex parking lot. March 10th, 1979, a woman's body found wrapped in a red blanket, dressed in a nightgown in a shallow creek in a sparsely populated area in Jackson County south of U.S. Highway 40. The body had been dumped from a bridge. Her hands had been tied behind her back. Her cause of death, likely strangulation. And she was identified as Lisa Holmes by her family on March 11th. The police connected Lisa and Michael to a group of people associated with burglaries and professional shoplifting. Somehow, after all, after all this, George Alvin Bruton uh, only gets sentenced to 10 fucking years in prison. He would only plead guilty to assaulting a federal officer with a deadly weapon and possession of firearms by a convicted felon. He seems to have cut some kind of deal with prosecutors. 
The exact details hard to find. Seems likely to me, maybe just because uh, I have last week's Irish mob information in my mind, that he ratted on other criminals more important to the FBI. Maybe they didn't have enough evidence to prove he killed Michael Walker and Lisa Holmes, never charged for breaking out of Leavenworth, taking hostages, wounding two officers in Utah. It's fucking weird. He had to have given the feds some good shit. Uh, anyway, after all this, he's paroled in 1988. By July of the following year, he's under investigation for more various crimes. Then in September of 89, he and associate or, uh, an associate are seen disposing black trash bags into a dumpster in Kansas City. The FBI obtained these bags, found Donna Sue's personal items inside. Her vehicle was found later in a storage unit used by Bruton. How the fuck was he still not arrested for her murder? But he wasn't. He was arrested for parole violation, August 6, 1990, indicted on drug charges, then identified as the leader of a multi-state drug ring. And then in July of 1990, a source told a federal agent that Bruton mentioned killing a woman named Donna because of her threats to expose his involvement in organized crime. This dude might have had some mob connections. Uh, Bruton was finally sentenced to life in prison, died in prison in 2008. He was 66. So Donna Sue Neldon, another woman he possibly killed that he was never charged for, is the last victim currently associated with the redhead murder. Sounds like we know who her killer was. Uh, the third woman, we have a pretty good idea uh, of regarding who killed him. But the 11 others, no idea, really. Maybe Terry Peter Rasmussen in one murder, maybe not. No clue in 10 of the 14 murders, but with the continual advances in forensic science, who knows? And that is it for this timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Before wrapping this date heavy story up with a few final thoughts, uh, how about one more sponsor? A very real one. One that originated in episode 234 of the Elon School Suck, and one that just makes sense for today. Can you guess what it is? I bet you can. Today's Time Suck is, of course, brought to you by Dad Watch, a 5013C nonprofit dedicated to solving dad related crimes. Dad Watch stands for Dads Are Disappearing Where All the Corpses Hide. Hi. Dan Cummins, Dad Watch founder. Did you know that roughly 50,000 people go missing in the U.S. each and every year? They're never found. And that many dads conveniently can't remember exactly what they were doing, where they were when those people went missing. Coincidence? Come on. We here at Dad Watch don't think so. The majority of the redhead and Bible Belt Strangler murders have no known suspects, but you can bet your sweet ass that all of the murderers are dads. Dads kill. It's what they do. It's what they've always done. And if you think that your dad is an exception, then your murdering ass dad done did raise a fool. Where was your dad last year? Last month? Can you account for his whereabouts the entire time? Where was your dad on September 8th, 2022, when Queen Elizabeth died of, quote, old age? Yeah, right. Some dad killed her. Where was your dad in the mid-80s, when the majority of today's victims were murdered? He was probably with my dad. Where were they both? I don't know if your dad or my dad is responsible for these murders, but I think they did probably do it. Like a lot of people with dads, they just want answers. We here at Dad Watch are just trying to do what's right. And what's right is putting your sick fucking murdering dad and mine behind bars where they belong. Call 1-800-DAD-WATCH with any and all not sure what your dad or mine is fucking up to information. Please, we have to stop this madness. Is that the ad you thought was coming? I bet it was. Uh, for the majority of the victims of the redhead murders. I, I really like that music, by the way. <laughs> Thanks to uh, v the channel uh, Silverman Sound Studios for putting that royalty-free little classic out called VHS Dreams. Makes me happy. Uh, for the majority of the victims of the redhead murders, their murders uh, still, or their murders, excuse me, still unsolved several decades later. Four women of the 14 remain unidentified. However, so many of the 10 who were identified were just identified in the past few years like Tina Farmer, S.B. Pilgrim Black, or sorry, Black Pilgrim, uh, Elizabeth Lamott. And that gives me hope that the identity of the four other women will also be revealed. It's getting harder and harder to get rid of the evidence of a murder, to just make someone disappear thanks to continual advancements in forensic investigative technology. Getting harder and harder to be a serial killer. And I love it. I would love to run out of serial killers to talk about, make it a thing of the past. I don't think that'll ever happen, not in my lifetime at least, but it's fun to think about. 
Investigators hope that by continuing to talk about the redhead murders, continuing to appeal to the public for more information, perhaps one day someone will come forward and the remaining Jane Doe cases can finally be solved. Who killed them? Uh, definitely more than one man. Hope we can catch at least uh, one of these assholes before they, before they die like the other suspects. You know, let at least one of these dudes, even if it's probably my dad, uh, spend their final golden years in a cell. I got to figure what kind of isotope stuff my dad has inside of him. I feel like he has a lot of Hungry Man TV dinner and gas station donut and coffee isotopes. Maybe a bunch of apple pie isotopes, a lot of chewable Tums isotopes. Quite a few vanilla ice cream isotopes. Not sure how, uh, you know, or not sure how y'all will be able to figure out how, they, how these isotopes can tie him to some of the murders he probably committed, but getting his isotopes certainly can't hurt anything. That settles it. I'm going to demand that he hand me over his fucking isotopes. Next time I see him, enough's enough. Now let's head to today's takeaways. I got nothing else. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the redhead murders are a series of murders of redheaded women in the United States. The victim count ranges from six to 14 and the murders range from 1981 to 1992. A lot of sources back that 81 date up to 78. Uh, investigators not sure exactly how many victims there are. There's disagreement about which victims can be classified as redhead murders. So these figures and years change from source to source and could change further if more bodies are uncovered. Number two, even though the murders happened in the mid-80s, the name Bible Belt Strangler did not show up until 2018 when a group of Elizabeth 10 high school students profiled a killer who they felt had committed some of the redhead murders. The students worked with law enforcement, researched the case to create a lengthy profile of a possible serial killer. They believed he was or is a trucker, uh, a trucker. Well, actually, they believed he was a trucker who traveled throughout the South and they named him the Bible Belt Strangler because of the location of the murders and the strangulation MO. Number three, the strongest suspect in the redhead murders is still Jerry Leon Johns. At least for some of them. He seems to have for sure killed one of the victims, Tina Farmer. In 1987, Johns was convicted of felonious assault, aggravated kidnapping against a woman in Tennessee. In 2019, he was posthumously, uh, posthumously, uh, indicted by a grand jury in the murder of Tina Farmer. The similarities between the two cases suggest they were committed by the same person. One victim's brave testimony got Johns incarcerated for the rest of his life, but then he died in prison before he could be prosecuted for Tina's murder. Number four, in 1985, investigators met to compare notes on the redhead murders cases. They determined that some cases were connected, others weren't. All agreed to share info with each other, but the meeting was largely unproductive. They did not identify a killer or make significant progress in connecting or identifying victims. This was the only large meeting amongst law enforcement in the redhead murders case. Investigators just had too many factors working against them to be able to solve these cases. And number five, new info. Let's talk about another serial killer truck driver who killed in the same area where these women were found. Bruce D. Mendenhall is an American serial killer who was arrested in Tennessee in July of 2007. Mendenhall was born in 1951, grew up in Illinois, married, had two children, and was a long-haul trucker. On June 26, 2007, Mendenhall murdered a woman named Sarah Holbert. On July 12, 2007, uh, Mendenhall was arrested at the TA truck stop on I-24 in Nashville, Tennessee, after a detective spotted a truck that matched a truck captured by surveillance footage on the night Sarah Holbert was murdered at the same truck stop. Inside the truck, the detective found bloody clothing, identification, and personal items of another woman from Indianapolis who had gone missing the day before. There were also blood spots inside the cab and on Mendenhall's hands. Inside the truck, the police found a rifle, knives, handcuffs, latex gloves, weapons cartridges, tape, a nightstick, and a bunch of sex toys. These items contained the DNA of five different women. Mendenhall's victims were mostly young sex workers. He implicated himself in the murder of both Sarah Holbert, Holbert and Samantha Winters, who was found in a trash can at a truck stop in Lebanon, Tennessee, June 6, 2007. In August 2007, Mendenhall was indicted for the murder of Samantha Winters and later convicted and sentenced to life in prison. After Mendenhall's arrest, he was investigated for up to seven additional murders, suspected of more. Other departments were looking into his connection with their cases since he spent 18 years driving across the country. On April 10th, 2008, Mendenhall was charged with the murder of Carmen Perpura. Uh, DNA testing linked the blood inside the truck cab to Carmen's parents. Investigators also found her phone, ATM card, and clothing still inside Mendenhall's truck. His fucking trophies, a sick fuck. She was reported missing in 2007, last seen at a truck stop in Indianapolis, July 11, 2007. Mendenhall was arrested the next day. Uh, he was being questioned after his arrest. He gave info about six murders in Indiana, Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. Told the Nashville police that he killed a woman he picked up at a truck stop in Indy the day before, dumped her body in a trash can on Harding Street, 
The police found the trash can, but no body inside. Carmen Papur's remains were later found along uh, the Louis B. Nunn Parkway in Barron County, Kentucky, August 15th, 2011. On July 28th, 2010, the Birmingham police now charged Mendenhall with the murder of Lucille Greta Carter, also. Found naked in a trash can with a plastic bag taped over her head in 2007. She'd been shot with a 22 caliber weapon. Finally, in October of 2021, Mendenhall transferred from Tennessee to Marion County, Indiana to be prosecuted for the murder of Carmen Purpura. Could this guy have killed some of the redhead murder victims? Some of the Bible Belt Strangler victims? I mean, he's the right age, born between 1936 and 1962, right occupation, right size, able to form stable relationships, worked in the right area, definitely a killer. Guessing they've already ran his DNA to see if it matches anything from the crime scenes we went over. And if not, eh, they probably should. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Bible Belt Strangler redhead murders have been sucked. Wish it had a more satisfying conclusion. But I do like hearing about those cool forensic advances. Gives me hope that more future murders will be solved and quicker. uh, So we can put the people behind bars while they're still active. And hopefully this narrative was okay. It was, uh, it was a tricky one. Even like, uh, come, you know, sharing the notes today, I felt like I needed a, a fucking war room chart, you know, connecting like tacks and pictures and pieces of yarn. There's a lot of different things happening all over the place. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for helping make Time Sucked every week. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to, uh, I believe it's Mr. Logan Keith producing today, The Art Warlock. And uh, doing some the directing. And thanks to Tyler C. for the production. Thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app. The Art, War- the Art Warlock again for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com. And for helping run our socials along with the Suck Ranger. And a team led by social media strategist Ryan Handelsman and currently managed by Emily Licardi. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for the initial research this week. And thanks to the All Seeing Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page. The Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth. Everyone over on the Time Sucks subreddit and the Bad Magic subreddit. I got a little Reddit notification the other day. Uh, yeah, thanks to uh, thanks to Burke Kreister for saying some some nice things about me when interviewing Kelsey Cook recently. That was very very kind, unprompted. So I was, uh, and I guess uh, in the comments there was some other podcaster lately saying some stuff. So that's cool. Uh, and thanks to the many fantastic sacks doing so much within this community. Next week on Time Suck. I, sometimes I don't like to say that I'm excited for a serial killer suck, but I am. I'm morbidly excited. Uh, to talk about a serial killer that did get caught and one who may have been fucking doomed to become a serial killer more than any other killer we've covered so far. Terry Blair. Terry killed at least seven women in Kansas City. Of course he did. His mom killed his stepdad when he was 16. His brother killed a woman 16 months later. His sister helped kill a guy. And these aren't the only murderers in his family. And there are rapists and more uh, you know, people committing crazy crimes. I've never come across a more fucking murderous family than Terry's family. The crazy ass story of Terry Blair, most murderous member of the very murdery Blair family next week. And right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. First update coming in from Superb Sack Blake Byer, who wrote in with an email subject line of Philly Show Heroes. A little uh, addition to last week when I talked about how someone died but then was saved in my early show in the Fillmore or at the Fillmore in uh, in Philadelphia. I put San Francisco in my notes because there's also a Fillmore there. Uh, This was sent into Scared to Death actually but makes sense here. Blake writes, hey, whoever's reading this, Lindsay, bad magician, intern, uh, tired of going through emails, so tired their eyes are bleeding, whatever. Uh, My wife and I were at the early show in Philly this weekend, had an absolute blast. The show was fantastic, and seeing you both in person was something we've been looking forward to for a long, long time. I'm glad Lindsay could be there. Uh, I'm writing to you because we were sitting only a few rows away from the medical emergency that paused the show. I was hoping you could give a cross-platform shout-out. Not sure if or which show they listened to, to the people who helped save that man's life. We saw the entire event unfold, offered to get involved. However, the situation was being handled masterfully by several of your amazing fans, known to us only as Flannel Shirt Guy and Pink Hair Woman. These top shelf meat sacks immediately began CPR, continued until uh, emergency services arrived. It was quite a scary situation, but these heroes didn't hesitate to get involved and did eventually get him breathing again before being taken away. It was a powerful moment of selflessness and heroism that deserves some recognition. Oh yeah, it sure fucking was. Well, not sure still who flannel shirt guy was, but 99% sure pink hair woman was Marlena Lesby. So hail Marlena. 
And glad you got to witness that heroism, Blake. So, uh, so incredible. Still hoping to hear how the guy who went into cardiac arrest is doing now. Well, now Blake adds, on a completely separate and optional note, my lovely, considerate, and selfless wife was kind enough to plan months ahead to give me a spoopy shout out in time for my birthday. And that's a scared of that thing. Uh, however, here we are three months past her birthday and I'm just emailing you now. Shame, shame, I know. She's the absolute best. So it has become a running gag between us for her to cheerfully ask every Wednesday, did you listen to the most recent Scared to Death followed by still no spoopy shout out, huh? Well, no spoopy shout out here on Time Suck, but I will give her a regular shout out. Scout, your swamp monster husband, Blake loves the shit out of you. Sure, he's an idiot and forgets to be as thoughtful as you are in many ways. He reminds me of me in that way. But know that he knows he is so lucky to have such an amazingly loving and supportive person as you, not just as his wife, but his best friend too. He loves you, cannot wait to add a little newt to the family. And finally know that Blake added some really nice stuff about liking what we do here, being inspired to be a decent sack and chase his fucking dreams. He's a good one, that Blake. And he ended his message with, may Nimrod smile upon all who inhabit the suck dungeon, hail Lucifina, and give Penny Pooper and Ginger a squeeze till they squeak for me. Well, thank you, Blake. I'll fucking squeak those little fluffy idiots. Penny Pooper and Gigi Bell. And now a uh, shitty sucker, a shitty New Orleans sucker, Roxanne, sent in something that just cracked me up. <laughs> she writes, hi, Time Suck crew. I'm a new mother of twin boys and time has become more valuable than ever these past two months. Sometimes I'll listen to Time Suck while I'm straightening up the house or getting another load of laundry going, but I'll never get through a whole episode in one go. I'll need to pause the show, come back to it later. And that's what led to the following. This morning, I got in the boys to nap. And was going to clean up. So I put in my headphones, returned to this week's episode. Upon resuming, I was met with you proclaiming that if you use your shit or someone else's shit as lube to masturbate with, I don't think you're a bad person. I was caught off guard and had to stifle my laughter so as not to wake the babies. My sweet infants who are just trying to sleep while their mom listens to a crazy man discuss the morality of masturbating with feces. (laughs) Thank you for making me question my entire existence and for starting my day off with lunacy and laughter. Roxanne in New Orleans. Well, Roxanne. Roxanne. First, I fucking love your name. It's one of my favorite names. Has been for a long time. Second, congrats on your twins. And also, you should get a medal or a trophy or something for giving birth to twins and raising them. Uh, Third, lunacy and laughter. My bread and butter. Yeah, the world's fucking crazy. Might as well be crazy with it, I guess. Uh, Glad you got some laughs. One more fecal message. Shit-hating sucker. Jeff Lundberg has finally fucking had it with my shit and wrote... So for the first time since I started listening to your podcast, this week's episode, part one of the Kirtland cult, made me yell at you. Out loud, on my drive home, I literally yelled, shut the fuck up, Dan, and was the most grossed out I have ever been. It was during the brown section of the show. But I did giggle when you said, you don't want to kink shame, but fuck that shit. And I said, yeah, that's what he likes. Sheesh. Love your shows. Love your work. Hail the almighty fork chucker, Jeff. Well, I get it, Jeff. Uh, that two-parter made me get up from my research and pace around saying stuff like, what the fuck? Why is this real? So many times. Jeff and Skidmark. What a special kind of insanity. Those two live together. Uh, now let me finish on another weird moment involving puppets. Swamp Sack. Ricky Galloway writes, hey, mother sucker. I want to try to keep this brief. I can't thank you enough for making it down to New Orleans. My wife, Katie, and I are huge fans of your stand-up. Big fans of Time Suck. Past weekend, we got to attend your show in NOLA. Had an absolute blast. We became instant friends with everyone around us. I fucking love that. And uh, even got free weed gummies in the process from our new generous friends. Uh, also, I know there were a considerable amount of fans, drunk or not, constantly chiming in during the set, but fuck, bud, your ability to steer the chaos was killer. Very glad we got to see how passionate the Cult of the Curious is and love the show, including the opener. I really wish I could remember his name. Well, his name is Doug Mellard, and he is truly one of the best dudes I've ever known. Like, honestly, beautiful, beautiful human being, beautiful meat sack, kind, generous, irreverent, funny, loyal. I could go on and on. Fucking love Doug Mellard. Uh, Ricky finishes with, anyway, we loved your opening reading of the absolutely insane puppet show at the end of the world flyer that you saw while in town. We thought it was hilarious. And the very next day while walking the quarter, we see it. The very fucking flyer you mentioned that I honestly thought may have been a bit embellished, but there it was. And actually took two full-size sheets of paper to include the insane amount of bullshit this person is promoting. Your take on the whole thing was amazing. It really made our weekend actually seeing this the next day. I'm sure you still have it, but I attached a photo of the flyer because no one would believe me if I hadn't for proof. We look forward to your next show in Louisiana. Thanks for everything you do. Your loyal and humble sucker, Ricky. Well, fucking Ricky, thanks for giving me an excuse to talk about that flyer again. Only in NOLA would you see this. And yes, I, I want to share it with everybody now. Let me read from the pic I took. 
This was at a coffee show called the Orange Couch in the Maroney. If any of you listening are familiar with the uh, New Orleans, and I, and I truly love how artsy and creative and just fucking weird. Let your freak flag fly, uh, New Orleans culture. It's, it's what what makes it one of my favorite cities in the world. And I just I just died seeing this poster because it's like this is like there's lots of hand drawn stuff here. You know, it's not just typed out. Someone put a lot of TLC into making this uh, promotional flyer for their production, and it says puppet show casting call. Looking for clowns and puppeteers for shows on April 13th to 17th. Maybe you can see it at the um, Happy Land Theater. This is posted by Nosepicka at Nosepicka on Instagram. That's how you can uh, contact to get involved, which is going to be too late as you hear this. But still, listen to the flyer, or like the, the, the synopsis for what this puppet show was. It says, show blurb. A peaceful village is crushed under boulders to make way for a giant rock gym turned eco resort. Two startup bros enjoy the new age experience until their company goes under. They're forced to stay on as indentured work traders to pay off the hotel fees. Will they be converted to the shady wellness culture or join a, or join a resistance to toxic positivity? <laughs> Fucking, that is like so preposterously uber specific. Like pup, a puppet show, first off, is so fucking niche. And then if you're doing a puppet show about the most obscure thing, and I just, uh, I was talking during the show in New Orleans, like uh, starting off with this about like, I, I just hope that this is somebody's like, this is, everything's fucking riding on this. Like they've maxed out their, <laughs> their credit cards to buy puppet supplies. You know, they, they got this fucking plan on the wall where it's like, okay, first we're just going to, we're going to fucking get the puppet show. We're going to start small. The puppet show in New Orleans, then we're going to build up bigger and bigger theaters. We're going to fucking take it on the road of a tour bus, a separate fucking uh, trailer for the puppets. Then obviously Netflix HBO get into a bidding war. Who wants to show the most? <laughs> like, it's just like, I love that they're doing this. I hope they're doing it just for fun, but I'm like, I had this conflicted feeling about this puppet show where part of me is like, there's probably only seven or eight people in the world interested in this puppet show. But at the same time, I would fucking love to see this puppet show. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, it, it's coming up in a couple weeks. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. If there's but anybody when, it, when this episode there, when this episode releases, I think it's going to be like within a day or two. Okay, if if it gives anybody time, definitely if if you can oh my God. check it out. And Please report. Know. Yeah. Please <laughs> sneak sneak a video and send yeah. the video to us. I honestly hope that it is fucking phenomenal. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Just like the same. You, I mean, I haven't seen the flyer, but you said a, a lot of work went into that. Oh I'd yeah. Assume mm -hmm. the production as well. So I hope yeah, it's top notch. Someone's down there. Get a sneak peek and, and let us know. Yeah, and, and I truly hope that I'm proven wrong. I would love this show two years from now to be trending number one on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, right. It gets picked up. <laughs> it's the it's the most talked about fucking new show uh, of the last like decade. It's like earth shattering. Earth shattering. It fucking <laughs> revolutionizes puppetry. Yeah. Uh, and and also just like uh, social commentary. Social commentary. Co social commentary. <laughs> <Right? laughs> uh, thanks everyone for the updates. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, everybody. Scared to death, time suck each week, secret suck uh, each week for you Patreon supporting space lizards. Uh, please don't run off with my dad and start adding to this uh, poor nation's unsolved murders this week. Just uh, stay away from him. K keep an eye on him, but, you know, keep your distance while you keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions. I haven't, I haven't really uh, railed on my dad for a while uh, with that joke. I, uh, he's mentioned it a few times in the past. I wonder if this is going to get back to him. There are some people in his circle that listen to the show. And I do wonder, like, is he going to get sick of it? And how crazy would it be if he, he's never murdered anybody? But like I just this fucking, makes him. This is I, the yep, catalyst. I keep making fun of him. I keep <laughs> making fun of him. And then finally, he fucking snaps and kills me, which would actually be a pretty legendary way to wrap up this podcast. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a nice little bow. Very memorable. I mean, sad for me and Tyler and everybody else, but but for the story, but I mean, the story that's a sacrifice that probably needs made. God, maybe maybe he could get uh, mentioned in that cool fucking new puppet show coming out. <laughs>